I think we're good to go. Meeting is live. Melissa, I'm making you the host now. Um, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me just put the video on. Okay, there we go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to 230 Conversations. Uh, before we start, we're just going to uh, have a word of prayer. So wherever you are, please just bow down your heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day that you have given us as we're about to start learning more about religion and uh, the LGBT uh, community. Lord, I pray that you may please guide us in this process. And Lord, I pray that you may open our hearts and allow us to be receptive to learning and allow us, Lord, to uh, transform where we need to be transformed and to grow where we need to grow. Be with us now, Lord, and I pray for peace and harmony as we discuss this critical issue. I pray, Lord, that uh, we may all uh, contribute positively and that, Lord, you may guide us throughout the whole process. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, uh, once again, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Our Facebook community, welcome to you as well. This is 230 Conversations, and you know what time it is. We're always here with the, with the stories, with the topics, with, with, with interesting you know, opinions and views from everyone. So uh, please remember that you have to be following us on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, so that you don't miss out on some of the announcements or the topics that we have to share with you guys. So please, please, please make sure that you're on all the platforms and you're following us. Okay, so today we are having religion and LGBTQI community okay it's such a like there's so many letters that's why it's also known as the alphabet community so um i think the the, the speaker will actually break it down for us what the lgbtqi means uh, i'm just going to try and say uh, the l stands for lesbians gays bisexual transgender queer and i'm not sure what the last one stands for so uh, i that's why the speaker is just going to take us through and educate us today what the the whole alphabet actually stands for and what this um how do we com uh, you know combine religion and how do we uh you know live with with this type of community and how do we learn to you know share our views in a positive light the next week we're going to have religion and spiritualism and that is going to be usandi leticia and the following week we are going to have the Entrepreneurship, the practical guide from Mr. O Chakarista. Um, the following week, we are going to, uh, you're going to get the topics as we go, right? So please remember that we are trying to talk about every critical societal issue. So some of the topics may spark, you know, debates and all that, just like the one of today. So just to go back again to the topic of today and the speaker, we have Ukulufelo Mpahlele, and he is going to be speaking on religion and the LGBTQI community. I need to stress this uh, before we start. Please note that um, we, we are aware that this is a very sensitive topic and that we have put a disclaimer so that we you know we don't find ourselves in trouble the views expressed during the conversations are of those of individuals so expressing them are not a reflection of 230 conversations the seventh day adventist church or its affiliates uh, position and or views whereas participants are encouraged to share their opinions and views without fear 230 conversations are bores and shall not tolerate hate speech and homing them attacks and or any conduct or views that seek to infringe on an individual's God-given and constitutional right to human dignity. 230 Conversations, its sponsors and affiliates shall not be held liable for any views, opinions, conduct, and or expressions that seek to undermine and infringe on God-given and constitutional rights. 230 Conversations aligns itself with and advances the position of the Seventh-day Adventist Church doctrines and practices. So this was well written by an advocate who knows the law. So, you know, we, we, we are protected by Zalani as to 30 conversations. But before I take too much time, um, the speaker, I just want to know if you are unmuted already. Kulufelo, are you, are you on? OK, 
Okay, do I have to unmute? Let me just find you. Okay, please unmute yourself. Hi, good day, good day, good day, how are you? We are well, thank you. The floor is yours, sir. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like to take this time to greet everyone online in the name of Jesus and uh, to greet my host uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this time, for this platform, this important platform uh, for us as believers, uh, for us as even the people of God in general. So we thank God for this platform. Um, I would like just to start our discussion uh, on this premise is that we will be speaking or addressing born again believers, people who are the people of God. We are not going to be addressing people who don't know God, people who don't subscribe to the Bible, people who don't subscribe to the scriptures. So that should be our premise at the very beginning so that we avoid a lot of um, heated uh, questions, controversial comments. We will be talking specifically to the people who says God is their final authority who says that the Bible as it is, is their final authority, is the people that we will be speaking to today. And then the people of the world who find themselves in this category, for themselves, we will just preach the good news of salvation. It's all that we'll be preaching to them. And when they have been converted to the Lord is when the Lord can then start speaking to them about these issues. So we'll be speaking to anyone and everyone who is a believer who find themselves struggling with these issues. They might be struggling personally, or there might be having a family member who's struggling, a friend who's struggling. So we'll be talking around that. So you don't have to be struggling for you to tune in, but you will be equipped so, but, so that you'll be able to help uh, anyone that you come across and dispense the grace of God, the love of God, and the truth of God to that individual. Um, quickly, I'll just go into the definition of our topic today. It has a lot of alphabets. I will just quickly just go through each and every one of them. And I've added uh, just few into that so that we have a full context of this topic. Or oh, it is LGBTQI plus, all right? And then we have uh, what is called an intersex. Intersex, it is um, the characteristics where a person find themselves that they have uh, the genitals or they have the chromosomes that are not characteristics of the, uh, uh, of, of the typical definition of male and female. You find out the person, they come out, they look like a girl, but then they're not a girl, or they look like a boy, but not a girl, but anatomically and physiologically. That is an intersex. Then uh, we have a sex in itself. A sex in itself, it is a, la a label that is assigned at birth on a child when they are born. And when that child is born, the nurses will take the child to the mother and say, what do you see? Pointing at the genitals of the child and the mother will say, I see a baby boy, I see a baby girl. That is what we call sex. And then we call, uh, we have what is called gender, all right? Gender is a societal construction um, of how a person should call themselves, all right? Um, we said our sex is when they take the child to the mother and say, this is a baby boy, this is a baby, this, this is a baby girl. But then agenda in itself, it's how the society interprets the female and female roles in themselves. So we, under gender, we have what is called gender stereotype. This refers to the ways we expect people to act or behave based on their sex. And then we have what is called gender identity. In gender identity, that child who has been uh, presented to the mother and the mother says the baby boy, then that baby boy will be given a chance to choose for themselves which gender they associate themselves with. They might be seeing themselves as a baby, they might be a baby boy anatomically, but then when they search themselves internally, they feel like I, I feel like I'm more feminine. Then that is a gender identity, how they're identifying themselves gender wise. And then we have what is called sexual orientation. Sexual orientation, it is the sexual attraction. Um, whether the person is attracted to the same sex, to the opposite sex or all sexes. And then we have a queer, which uh, describe many ways people use to reject a binary category of gender 
and sexual orientation. All right. And then this again can be the umbrella term for LGBTQI community. And then again, we have uh, a gay, all right, it's a sexual orientation of a person who they are sexually attracted to the person of the same sex. And then that mostly refers to the male gender or men. And then we have lesbians is the same one, but then it is when the sexual attraction towards a woman. And then we have a bisexual, which is the attraction to both uh, male and female. And then we have a pansex is being attracted to all different kinds of people, all different kinds of gender is pansex. And we have what is called asexual. It may be, the person may be attracted to the people, but not desire to have sex with them. And then we have a transgender. It's a person who feels that they are finding themselves in the wrong body. They, they, they have the anatomical physique of a male, but then they identify themselves as a, as a female. So they are trapped in the wrong body. All right, uh, this definition, there are many, I'm not gonna say all of them because of time. And then I would like us just to look into Romans one, Romans chapter one. In Romans chapter one, the Lord describes um, the state of a fallen man. He says that man falls to a place where um, they no longer, um, they no longer desire to have sexual relation with the person of the opposite sex. And then they and then the female as well, they no longer desire a male. And then the Lord goes on and mention other sins. It is important for us to read all those other sins that the Lord mentions. All right. He says that being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit evil-mindedness, uh, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. And in the prior verse, it says, likewise, also men living the natural use of the woman, bend in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which is which was due, all right? With that point, when you read the whole chapter going down, it's, it ends by saying that um, there'll come a time where men will fall so much, will fall so much that they will invent new ways of sinning. And that is an operative way. They will invent new ways of sinning. And after inventing new ways of sinning, they will encourage other people to join in. Hence, I'm saying these letters are so many. And let me assure you, these letters will be increased if the Lord tarries. If we stay longer in this earth, uh, let's say maybe 30 more years to come, these letters will increase. Why are they increasing? Because men will be creating more ways to disobey God. So therefore we won't go into all of them because it's just a progression of the fallenness of men. All right. And then I would like us just to have this as, as where we are starting, like where we are starting. All of us in this platform, or most of us in this platform are believers. We have subjected our life under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have given our lives to the Lord. And then we have decided to say that the Bible, we say that the Bible is the highest authority in our lives. All right. So as we begin this conversation, after we have looked into the definitions of our topic today, so I would like us just to move with this very important point that the Bible is the highest authority in this discussion that we're having today. All right, I'm going to say that again. The Bible, the word of God, it is the highest authority in our discussion today. I won't be giving Kulifela's opinion. I will, I will not be giving Buddhist's opinion. I won't be giving Melissa's opinion. I won't be giving anybody's opinion, but we will be giving what God thinks about this issue. And I would like to ask everybody when we are asking questions, when we're engaging, to always go back to the word and not say what we think, because we think so many things and we are clashing. And my opinion cannot give anybody life. And your opinion doesn't have life. Only God's word, which is the highest authority, has life. So as believers, can we establish that the Bible is the highest authority in this conversation? And then the Bible is still relevant even today. Yes, the LGBTI community, they've tried to revise the Bible and say the Bible is not relevant. The Bible is taking them out. The Bible is uh, kind of condemning them in a way. They kind of revise the Bible. They try to do that because there are other versions of the Bible that have been changed. Where the Lord says, do not do this, they've changed it in another way. They've interpreted the Bible in some Bible verses in another way to suit them. But then I would like us to 
take this message home that the Bible is still relevant to us today, raw as it is, all right? Somebody might say, but cool fellow, things change, season changed, eras change, people come, technology comes, uh, uh, science comes, we, we are always evolving. So when we're evolving, why doesn't the Bible evolve with us? And that's a very important, uh, important uh, uh, question right there, all right? The reason why the Bible doesn't evolve with our evolution, it is this one reason. The only thing that remain constant in me and in you is our nature. Our nature doesn't change. Our fallen nature is the same nature that Adam have, that the people of the Old Testament have, those who live 2000 years ago, they had the same nature that you and I have. And then even after long we have passed, I have passed, 2,000 years to come, if the Lord tarries, the people, those will be in that era, they'll be having the same nature of fallenness like me and you, the same nature described in the Bible, all right? The same nature described in Romans 7, okay? So if we're having the same nature, that doesn't change. Therefore, it means that the Bible should not change because the Bible is the one that is addressing our nature, that is uh, helping us how to subject our nature to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I hope that is clear. So the only thing that is changing is technology. Technology as we know it today, it will be quite different in 10 years to come. But then changing of technology doesn't mean that our nature has changed. We will be as fallen, as corrupt as ever, and will be the same as the people of the past. So hence we say the Bible is still relevant for our fallen nature, even though evolution, technology, science keep on changing. All right, so the Bible is, um, is, is our highest authority in this uh, in this discussion. So before we do discussions and before we get into question and answers, I just want to run uh, through a few points just to give us a structure so that we discuss within a structure because it's a very huge topic, it's very huge. And then if we don't give it a structure, we might spend the whole day and the next day discussing it and then another one put in that direction, another one put in that direction. It's such huge and won't even finish it today. So I'm gonna just give a structure into what we should speak into at least for today, all right? Because it's fast, it's huge, all right? All right, just a quick look. Okay, point number one, all right, I would like to say, we've already established that the Bible is the highest authority in today in this meeting. All right, not my authority, not my experience, not my knowledge, but the Bible, the word of the Lord. All right, then point number one that I would like us to take is that I'm going to be defending God just right now. Defending God, all right. Uh, defending God in the sense that, um, as I said before, that um, the Bible has been revised to suit the fallen nature of people today. The Bible has been revised or is being revised to suit this community. I mean, to suit some of the believers who find themselves struggling in this community. And most of the believers are, they are precipitating towards the revision of the Bible, all right? But I'm here to defend God. Why am I defending God? Um, I'm defending God because God, he is a just God. He is a just God. He is a gracious God, full of grace, full of love, full of mercy, all right? At the same time, having these three, grace, mercy, and love, having all those three, he's still a God of judgment, all right? A God of judgment, whenever I sin, maybe I gossip about my brother, and then the Holy Spirit convicts me that, cool fellow, stop gossiping, and I continue gossiping. Then the Holy Spirit convicts me again and again and again. I continue again and again gossiping. Then God, there will become, there will come a point where God will rise up as a God of judgment, because while he was convicting me again and again, it was God of mercy, God of grace convicting me for me to change and to amend my ways and to repent. But if I continue in my ways, all right, God will rise up as a God of judgment and then judge me for my sin. All right, that's a, that, that's a, that, that, that's a, that, that's a, 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 the word that always causes uncomfortability in the culture of today, judge. When I say God, God will rise to judge you, people don't want to hear that. But we have said that the Bible is the highest authority and the Bible tells that God will judge every sinner in this life and in the life to come. So Romans 1 verse 18, Leviticus 18, 22, Romans 1, 27, won't, won't be reading them. I'm just quoting them up there. They, all of them, these scriptures, they are all explicitly uh, condemning the homosexual act, all right? And then I'll just use the word homosexual act, but when I use that, please include all others, lesbians, gays, transgender, intersex, include all of them in that term, all right? All right, the word of the Lord in this um uh, 
verses I've quoted, the, the Bible explicitly condemns the homosexual act, all right? It says it's sin, it says it's detestable before God, it says God hates it, and God uses a strong word right there. He says he hates the act, he hates the lifestyle, all right? Okay, that is established. I'm defending God in that instant, and I would like the church to be able to stand up and say God hates it, to stand, by, to stand up and say God will judge it. Even though the world, the social and the culture of today is pushing the church further and further to not use the word judge, to not ever to say uh, God will judge the world of this sin of homosexuality. The, the world is saying, be nice, be kind, be, 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 be chilled about it. But the Lord is not chilled about it. The Lord says, I will judge those who are committing this act. And then he ends by saying it's abominable to him. So as we said, the word of the Lord is the highest authority. So I am establishing today in this church, in this online church, that please let's be bold to say God condemns homosexual lifestyle, homosexual act, and then God hates it and God will judge it. It's how we defend God. We must go, go out there and defend our God by our words. All right. Then somebody might say, Cool, isn't God a loving God? Isn't God a gracious God? Yes, He is. He is a loving God. He is a loving God. Before He judges, a person for his sin, he will always, as a must, as a matter of must, as a matter of must, he will always come and convict the person again and again and again, using a conscience, inner voice, using believers, using scriptures, using pastors, but then a man, because of love of sin, because men love pleasure more than they love God, they will continue with their sin, and God will chase men, will chase men, will chase men day after day, but then there will come a time God say, it is over now, I have to meet uh, a judgment right now. I have to rise up as a just God and judge this sin because I have wrestled with men for some time. All right. So yes, God is a loving God. He's a gracious God. He will always chase. He will always chase you to the end of the earth. I, I want you to have that in your heart that God will always chase you to the end of the earth to win you back to himself to draw you back to himself, to love you, to, 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 to love you, to, 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 to draw you into himself. He'll always do that. And he'll always avail his grace and mercy to help you with any struggle that you're having, with any sexual struggle we are having. All right. That's where you see the love and the mercy of God. It will chase you for a longer time before judgment comes. All right. And then number two, um, the church must be able to communicate the restorative grace of God. Uh, okay, the restorative grace of God is when the church um, accept the truth that I sp I've spoken about. What, what, what kind of truth is that? Accepting that God uh, hates and will judge and detest these sexual practices, all right? All right? The church must accept that truth first. And after having accepted that truth first, then the church must align with that truth. And after aligning with that truth, then it's when the church can can be able to uh, release the restorative grace to the people who are struggling with these sexual sins, all right? You cannot restore somebody when you don't acknowledge the truth yourself, all right? I'm gonna say that again. You cannot restore somebody who's struggling with any kind of sexual sin or any kind of other sin, it can be gossip, can be uh, whatever kind of sin, envy, jealousy. You cannot restore that person unless you yourself have, you have aligned yourself with the truth, you have aligned yourself with what the Bible says. So the church must align first and agree with the truth and then be able to release the grace of God to the people who are struggling, all right? The church must be able to accept people who are struggling with these sexual sins, must be able to embrace them, must be able to offer accountable accountability partners, must be able to offer pastoral counseling, must be able to offer deliverance counseling, all right? We're not gonna go into that because of time. And then most importantly, the church must be able to dispense the grace that takes away condemnation in these people. The church must be able to give the grace that takes away guilt in these people who are suffering with this kind of sexual sins because they come with so much guilt, with so much condemnation from the time that they're realizing that they're struggling with this kind of sin, then guilt and shame and condemnation becomes like a cloud on their head. So the church must be able to release a grace to really deal with them, all right? Then number three, which is very, very important, the church must always hold on to the truth, all right? The church has been given the mandate or the authority to shift the culture. 
It's what we've been given as a church. Yet it's not like that in our days, in most of our places, most of our neighborhood is the culture that influences the church. Is the church that looks outside the world and looks what is the current culture like? And then the church copies the culture and brings it to the church. But then what we are supposed to be doing as the church, we are supposed to be uh, taking out the truth of the Bible and using the truth to influence the culture outside, all right? And then if we don't align with the truth, accept the truth and allow the truth to work in us, then the culture outside will be will control us, all right? And then when the culture from the world influences the church, dictates what the church should say, like we know today, we are being dictated on what to say about LGBTI community. We are being dictated on how to say and what to say when we are speaking to homosexual. You cannot just say anything. You are being dictated. The culture of the world is really like pressing onto the church. And that's a state that you don't find, you don't want to find ourselves in. And we, we, we must and we should break out of that mood. We break out when we stick to the truth and we speak the truth. And then we must avoid, the church must not avoid the truth. Whenever you are, wherever you are, whomever you are with, whenever this topic comes up, don't be shy to speak the truth. Just speak the truth in love. Speak it. You are not fighting anybody. You are just speaking the truth. Don't minimize the truth when you're in conversations. Like today, I mustn't minimize the truth. We mustn't revise the truth as well to suit our preferences, all right? Because when truth is avoided by the church, when truth is minimized by the church, when truth is revised by the church, then the truth will be denigrated, the truth will be distorted, and lastly, then the truth will be prohibited, all right? And then um, there's this, these six things I just want to read for you. These are the LG, LGTPI, LGBTQI campaign that was constructed many years ago. They constructed this six point. They said, if we can establish this six point in our community, we'll be able to suppress the truth, even the truth that comes from the church. And after having suppressed the truth, then we'll be able to prohibit the truth. And we know that today the truth has been prohibited. You cannot just say anything you want on the pulpit. You cannot just stand boldly in a funeral where, when many people are there, believers and non-believers, and stand and say, God will judge homosexuality. You can be even taken to prison. You'll be taken to the newspapers. Why? Because the truth has already been prohibited. But the, for it to be prohibited, the devil starts by allowing the church or forcing the church to avoid the truth, to minimize the truth, to revise the truth. All right? And then... These six points that uh, the LGBTQI community have constructed, they, they have brought this six point in order to force the church into a corner or cause the church to gradually, bit by bit, to avoid the truth, to minimize the truth, and to revise the truth until the truth is prohibited like it is prohibited today. All right, number one, this campaign that was uh, coined down many years ago, okay, this, uh, it says that number one, it says, Talk about gays and gayness as loudly, as often as possible, all right? Is the campaign or is a, is a, is a, is a, is a campaign? Yes, it's a campaign. I don't want to call it that agenda. It's a campaign, all right? It's a campaign that is out there. And then it's rotating in the LG, LGBTQI community. It's rotating everywhere in the media, uh, social media, wherever, you, wherever you, you, you meet people, even in schools, even in some churches, they say you must, they must always talk about gays, they must always talk about gays uh, and gayness as loudly as, as loudly as often as possible. And when they talk about gay and gayness as loudly and as often as, often as possible, it's like advertising. Even though you are not interested because you are hearing it again and again and again, it keeps on coming to your mind and over time, when they say it, you are desensitized to it. Then when they mention about gays and lesbians, you just shrug your shoulder because you have been desensitized. You have been sold the idea indirectly by hearing it again and again and again. All right. So we must guard the entrances of our ears and of our minds. Then number two, they say portray gay as victims, not as aggressive ch challengers. All right. Have you heard that? And it's what is happening today. Um, the gays are always being portrayed, pro uh, portrayed as victims, not as aggressive challengers, all right? Yes, we do agree that in some places, in some communities, people, they are victimizing gay people, which is bad, and we condemn that as a church, and we come strongly against that as a church. Nobody should be victimized at all, all right? But then, 
we must be fair on both sides. Even from the other side of homosexual people, they must agree that there's an aggression from their side because for them to push this agenda on us, they push it on our school. They teach your child that uh, uh, another baby could have daddy and daddy in the same house, could have a mother and a mother in the same house. They teach your children at school without your permission. That is aggression. That is being aggressive because they didn't ask for your permission to teach your child that. And when your child comes from a kindergarten, he tells that mommy, um, they told us that you can have two daddies, you can have two, two mothers. That is aggression. But then they say we must, they portray themselves as victims. So the church must be aware of that. When the victim mentality comes out, we must not believe it. We must say, you are not victims. You are not victims at all. Yes, some are victims, but you are not victim entirely, all right? Then number three, it says, give protectors a just cause. A protectors is government. Because now they've made them victims. Then when the protector comes to protect them, they can do whatever they can do to protect the people. They can even take the pastors to jail. They can even take a mother to, to jail, a mother who says they don't want their child to a, do a sex assignment. If the child says, okay, he's a boy anatomically, but then he says, I want to change into a girl and the mother says no, that mother can be taken out of the way and say, let the child do what they want, all right? So the protector comes and do whatever they want at whatever extent. Why? Because they have won the victory of portraying themselves as victims always, even though it's not entirely that, all right? Then number four, make gays to look good. All right, that is a very obvious. We see it in our workplaces, on social media, on TV. It's, a, it's one of the campaign to make gays to look good. Why do they look good? So that they be attractive. When you see their lifestyle, you say, wow, okay. Then when our young people, uh, those who are coming of age and those who are still uh, realizing, realizing themselves sexually, when they see them looking good, looking nice and driving expensive cars, that is a good lifestyle. I wanna join that. That is not a good, that's, that is not a bad idea. I can be part of that, all right? So that is a tactic as well to make them to look good. All right. Then number five, make the victimized, make the victimizers look bad. We have already covered that. All right. Then solicit funds. That is happening all over the world. The last point is that this campaign it solicits funds. These funds they go into LGBTQI community, and then these funds they are they are used to make movies, the movies that promote this, the movies and the books and anything that can promote this, it goes into this to support this. And when you have money, you are more strong, all right? But we say all those six, they are being brought specifically to the church so that the church can do what? Can avoid the truth, can minimize the truth, can revise the truth until the truth is prohibited. And we find ourselves in that place where the truth is prohibited. No wonder even here, when we started our two-stage conversation, we had a disclaimer. Why did we have a disclaimer? Because somebody out there, somebody in authority is prohibiting this truth. They have won the battle. That's why we're having disclaimers. We were not supposed to be having disclaimers in the first place but we are having them because the truth has been prohibited. But then may the Lord may help us as a church to rise up with the truth and say, Lord, whatever we have avoided, whatever we have minimized, whatever we have um, uh, uh, revised, Lord, help us to take it back to where you want it to be. All right, all right. Then we say this truth, when we speak it as a church, we must speak it with grace, all right? We must speak it with grace. We must speak it with grace, not condemning people, not name bashing, not um, shaming people, not condemning people, not classifying people. You talk to them with grace, with love, all right? So it's truth and grace. It's how the church should speak into this issue of, um, of, of these sexual struggles. They should use grace and truth. And grace, it's not being over sympathetic because other things that believers do, they say, I'm working in grace when they are being over sympathetic, when they are being over understanding, when they are being over tolerant to sin. They tolerate sin so much. They understand a person's struggle so much. And then they give them a leeway to sin. They give them a leeway to continue sleeping around. They say, I understand. I'm giving them grace. That's not grace. Great, it says, I understand your struggles and I sympathize with your struggles and I'm praying for you and I love you and I'm here for you to support you, to be with you. And I am here as well to speak the truth of the word, what the Lord says. You might not like it, you might not approve of it, but I will speak it. But at the same time, I will love you. And most importantly, I will protect you from any victimization. All right. Then the church must receive, okay, the church must receive 
the homosexual struggling people. And then we have what we call homosexual struggling and we have homosexuals. Homosexual struggling is a person who's conflicted about their feelings. Okay, they are having the homosexual feelings, but then they don't like it. They don't like the way they feel. They don't like that they are attracted to the same sex. They don't like it. They are conflicted. We call them homosexual struggling. But then a person who has accepted it and then they like it and then they practice it, that people, that person is not struggling. They are living it. It's their lifestyle. So that it's so Believers who are born again and saved and they're in the church, they are the ones who are struggling. And the church must have enough love and enough grace to receive them in. And then when we have received them in, we must be able to uh, lead them into repentance. We must be able to uh, uh, give them the pastoral counseling. We won't go into that. Give them a pastoral counseling, give them the support that they need, all right? And then... Uh, we need to encourage them to pursue holiness and then we need to encourage them to renew their mind, all right? And then most importantly, as the church, while we are receiving the homosexual struggling into the church, we must be able to, um, to employ church discipline because at times, um, because at times when we are trying to accept a person who's struggling with homosexuality, who's struggling with being a lesbian, who's struggling with uh, being transgender, all those alphabets, they're struggling in one of them. And when they are struggling, um, sometimes some of them, not sometimes, some of them we find that they are struggling, but then some of them they decide to sin intentionally and intentionally as an operative way. They sin intentionally going around, sleeping around, and then they come to church, sleep around, come to church, and then the church becomes aware. So the church must install a church discipline, must not be over sympathetic and say, we are using grace, we're not gonna say anything. The church must sit the person down, speak to the person, follow the whole protocol of excommunication. And when the person is still rebellious and they want to continue in their ways, in their sinful ways, then the church must excommunicate the person. And then if the person still continue with their evil ways in the church, not wanting to repent even after being excommunicated, then the, then the church can regard that person as an unbeliever. So the church must not shy away from church discipline, not uh, shying away in the name of we will be judged by the world. The world will say we are homophobic because the, the culture of the day, they're using homophobic as a bullying tool. They use it and they bully the church, not the church to stand for the truth. They say, when you stand for the truth, you are homophobic. When you express the truth, you are homophobic. When you leave the truth, you are homophobic. It's like a, 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 a bullying bait on, they, they whip you with it whenever you try to express the truth. All right. So the church must not be afraid of that. The church must just stand up and stand out for the truth and implement the church at discipline. All right. Then the last two points are before I close. Uh, the last two points. Uh, this one is very, very important, uh, even for us today. Um, the church must be aware of the hate crime and hate speech. All right. The church must be aware of hate crime and hate speech. We know that that has been legislated. All right. So the hate speech is when you are saying words that are emotionally damaging to another person. That's the hate speech. The words that are emotionally damaging the person and they make a person to lose their integrity. And then we have hate crimes. When you are doing something by action, they would damage somebody's property, you cause physical injury. That is um, hate crimes. So hate crimes and hate speech, they've been legislated and those, that legislation is there to protect the minority groups, all right, or to protect the victimized groups, all right? And then this community, it falls under that minority group, which is under question, in my perspective, is under question, if they are really, really under, if they are really, really a minority, all right? We won't go into that now. So this hate speech and hate, hate speech and hate crime, as a church, we say, yes, we are not for hate speech, we are not for hate crimes. We will not name call anyone, we will not shame anyone, we will not condemn anyone, we will not cause injury to anyone, we will not cause injury to the property of anyone. And we say, as a matter of fact, if I walk on the street and I see people beating a homosexual guy for being homosexual, I will go there and intervene and stop in between the people and say, you cannot do this. I will stand and defend the person. All right, not that I'm defending the act itself, I'm defending the person because the person is loved by God, is what the church should do, and the church should say yes to that. All right, but secondary to that, this hate crime and hate speech, it becomes slippery slope because the culture of the day, 
and the community in itself, LGBTQI community in itself, they are trying to insert the thought crimes and intent punishment. They are using the hate crimes and the hate speech to penalize you or to punish you for expressing your thought, which is wrong, which is very, very wrong. And I'll say it again, and I want the community itself to hear me. It is wrong to use the hate crime and the hate, hate crime and the hate speech to stop people from expressing their thought, expressing their opinion. In this example, the example is this, I am a believer, all right? And then I have an opinion. Actually, it's not my opinion, it's the opinion of Christ, the opinion of the scripture. As when we open, we say the Bible is the highest authority in our lives. So I hold the opinion of scriptures. So when I say I am for, I am for traditional family unit, I am for a man marrying a woman. And I am not for men marrying a man. I am not for women marrying a woman. I am not for that. But I am for husband and wife. And then I am not for a man sleeping with another man. I am not for that. That is my opinion. I should be allowed to express that opinion because by expressing that opinion, I'm not hating anyone. I'm not causing emotional injury to anyone. I'm not causing physical harm to anyone. It's just my opinion. And even them in their community, they must say what they think about what they do, what they are for and what they are not for. And then I allow them to express their opinion. They must allow us to express their, our opinion. So we must be balanced in that way. But then here there's no balance. They use hate crime, hate speech to kind of suppress the church, to press the church. Don't even express, don't even express what you feel. Don't express what you think. Don't even transmit your thoughts or your opinion to your own children. Don't tell your children that a family is made up of mommy and daddy. When you're doing that, you are limiting the child or say all sorts of things. And it's in your own home. They are invading your home and telling you what to teach your children. That it's off the line and that must change. And it will change if as a church, we stand up, we say, yes, we condemn hate speech, we condemn hate crimes, but we will not allow anyone to stop us from expressing our opinion to express, um, to express what the Bible says about us, all right? And then last thing is that um, just speaking to somebody who might be struggling with any of this alphabets that we spoke about, because there are many, any of this alphabet that we have, we, have, we have spoke about. If you are struggling with this and you are a believer, I wanna say that the only thing that makes a difference is your love for God. And I always, when I counsel people, I always try to detect, I always try to see if this person really, really loves God. And if they really love God with all of their heart, with all of their mind, I know that they will be okay. They will come okay. But then other people, they say, I'm struggling, but they don't love God enough. If you don't have too much love for God, if you don't have the burning love for God, you won't be able to stick it out in the counseling process in the process of coming out, in the process of being processed out of this alphabet, you won't have the stamina, you won't have the endurance to stick it out. So I'm saying to you out there, pray that Lord, burn your love into my heart, help me to love you more so that I love you so much that I will do anything to get out of this. I'll do anything and I'll enjoy anything I'll go I will go through any process, no matter how long that process takes, no matter how painful that process is, I will go through that process because I love you, God, and I want to obey your commandment. And my motivation for uh, coming out is because I love God. It's not because of my own comfort. No, it's not for my comfort. It's for my love for God. And if we pin it down for the love of God, that I love God so much, I want to do right. I love God so much that I want to, I love God so much that I want to live right. I love God so much that I don't want to hurt God. I don't want to disobey the standard of his words. You will be all right. And then when we walk with you in a pastoral counseling, you will do well. And then we will not go into how we'll go about when we are helping a person out who's struggling. That is a whole lot of process that will only speak with a person who really, they really, really need help. But then it takes, a message that you should take home is that pray and say, Lord, I'm struggling with one, two, three. But as a first and foremost, bend me with your love. And when your love is bending in my heart, I will stick it out. I'll go through and I will go into the ends of the world with you. And I know that I will be fine. All right, I will stop it there. And thank you for your audience. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, uh, Kulufilo. That was very um, inspiring, uh, especially from the point of view that sometimes as a church, we, get, we become a bit scared, um, especially to, you know, voice out where we stand. But again, you know, somebody who's listening to you out there may say, okay, but you're speaking from a perspective of a straight person. You are speaking from a perspective of someone who doesn't have any struggles, right? So what gives you authority to speak on the specific subject? And do you understand what uh, gay people go through? I mean, some of them, apparently um, it's biological, um, you know, there's some things that go on there and that make them the way they are. So do you perhaps have any, uh, you know, personal experience to draw from, from? Um, or, you know, so that we don't uh, speak as those that are not inclined or fully understanding the nature of, uh, you know, the LGBTQI community. So, yeah, just just before I read the comment section, because I can see it's burning with a lot of comments and uh, questions as well. I just want to find out from you, um, is there any uh, personal experiences you can draw from or is there, or are you speaking as a straight man and you are, you know, speaking from the knowledge that you, you have pro probably from church or, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you everybody. Yes. Uh, all right. Um, I would like to say that this is very, very important for everyone. Uh, I would like just to address this just once and for all. It's very, very important for everyone, even for me, all right, even for me as believers, because now we are addressing the believers. We are not addressing the world, all right? It is very, very important to understand that the Lord has instituted a church and, and on the church, he has given fivefold ministers, the pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers. And then he has said he has given these fivefold ministers grace to build the church. He has given them grace and gifts and anointing to build the church, to cleanse the church with the word, to restore the church, to deliver the church in any area of struggle. Give it gossip, be it jealousy, be it depression, be it suicidal thoughts, be it uh, even in the sexual issues, all right? And then how the Lord did it, because we must do things how the Lord did them, not how we want things to be done, okay? So the Lord has given them authority and grace for them to, equip the church and to restore the church. And then he said they will do it through the anointing, through the mantle, through the gifts, not through the experiences. Yes, experience, personal experience is very important. Personal testimony is very important. But personal testimony experiences, they must not be above the word. No, people of God, personal testimony, personal experience must not be raised above the word to say, I will believe it when I see it, personal testimony. All I've been doing, I've been quoting the scriptures. So you must believe what the scriptures say. And then when I come with my testimony, it's just a confirmation. It's just an addition. But you don't use my testimony or my leg of testimony to disqualify what I have said. That is very, very wrong. I'll give you an example, an example that even touches home. All right. I've seen many people as a pastor who suffer from suicidal thoughts. Né? Then when other people, they try to, when God, actually, when God sends other people to speak to them, to release a word that can deliver them from suicidal ideation, all right, then these people, they say, no, I'm not going to listen to you because you look happy, you look happy life with happy pictures on Facebook. I want somebody who had had suicidal thoughts and suicidal attempt to speak to me, all right, all right, and then that person who had suicidal thoughts and attempts comes and speaks to the person. You know what I've seen? After the person, after they've had a personal testimony of a person who had who had had the same suicidal thoughts and depression, the same person, they don't change, they don't get delivered, they go and kill themselves. So, what was the use of them rejecting the counsel of God on the premise that the person doesn't have experience, they are happy because they punish you, they punish you for being happy. You cannot speak into their life because when now you are happy, you, they must be spoken to by the depressed. When the depressed come, they don't take it; they still kill themselves. So. Before I give my personal experience, I just want to say to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's raise the Bible above our testimony. Let's raise the testimony of Jesus above our testimony. Hence, I don't like to even 
go to my personal experiences when I speak about these issues because I lift up the testimony of Jesus far above everything and the authority of scripture is final and the authority of scripture can deliver you totally and completely. It can and it will. You don't need a testimony. That is just a confirmation. All right. And to answer your question, yes, um, I, I've struggled with uh, homosexuality for quite some time. I have struggled with that in my developmental years um, from, yeah, maybe eight, nine, ten. Yeah, somewhere there. Yeah, eight, nine, ten. When I was coming off into uh, coming off into myself and coming into the the, the alignment. Uh, coming into my, my, my awareness as a person, yes. Then I struggled with that for quite some time. And then I grew up in a traditional church, a church that loves the Lord. They love the Lord. They, they speak the scriptures, nothing but the scriptures. But then it was back in the days. And then you cannot speak to anybody about that because it's not spoken in the church. No one is speaking about it. And it seems like no one is struggling with it. When you look around, it seems like no, everyone is okay. And then they think I'm okay. And then you just keep, you just keep it into yourself. But what helped me, as I said, with my last statement, you must love God too much that you will do anything to come out. You will do anything to be processed out. What helped me it was my love for God. I really love God above everything. I love God above any pleasure. I love God above any pleasure of sin. I love God above everything. And that love, that burning love kept me pushing, kept me asking, kept me inquiring, kept me praying until God finally brought me into a process where he literally took me out and brought me into a place where I am right now. And I can tell you that it's a good place where I am right now. But then the key is you gotta love God more than any other thing. But let me tell you that even, let me tell you this, that even many for, let me tell you this, all right? Many people, even after watching this testimony, seeing me like this as a married guy, I'm a married guy, I'm a happily married man. I've been married for seven years. Yeah, I've been married for seven years to a very beautiful woman, very beautiful woman, a woman who fears the Lord. I've been married, we've been happy, we've been content. We've been like, a, we, we have a godly marriage, like godly, godly marriage and I'm content. I don't wanna go back. Going back is not where I'm going. It's not where I'm going. I'm not going back because I love it here. So I, 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 so I wanna say that, um, Many people, after hearing this testimony, many people who are struggling with homosexuality, who are struggling with being a lesbian, who are struggling with all those alphabets, after hearing this, this testimony will, won't help them out, will not push them to go and find help, will not push them to say, Lord, I need you, will not push them to live a whole life. They will continue their struggles. So they, they are lying when they say, want to hear your personal testimony. It's just a curiosity to, to just to hear what you have gone through. But then it's not that they're asking from a place of wanting to change. Because a person who wants to change, when they hear the word, the word will convict them and they'll cry and say, Lord, your word is final. I believe your word. And for me, I didn't have anybody's testimony. No, I didn't have anybody's testimony. I had the word, only the word by myself. I had to dig into the word by myself. And I said, Lord, I believe your word. I remember praying as a young boy, I said, Lord, I believe your word. And when your word says you don't like this, you don't want it, and there's help, Lord, I believe your word, and your word will take me out. And the word took me out, and I didn't wait for anybody's testimony. I didn't have anybody's testimony. I didn't have anybody I knew. You get it. So it is a lie. So I'm just rebuking that even on this platform. You don't need the testimony. You need to obey the scripture of the word. The testimony of a person is just to confirm what has already, what is already happening in your heart. All right. I will just uh, leave it at that. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for answering that question. I'm just going to take a few more hands. And for those that may have been, you know, commenting under the impression that, you know, you're just bashing or you are, you are not coming from a point of, you know, your own story where you've overcome and where you've drawn your own lessons. Um, I hope that that was also uh, picked up from this answer. I'm just going to ask uh, Admiral Nube. I'm going to unmute you. Um, and then we'll go to the comment section. I see there's a lot of comments. We will get to that. Some of them may not be read out, but we will try and do our best. Okay, Admiral. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. No, thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for, for that passionate uh, presentation. And um, nothing can fight somebody's testimony. Um, there's, there's more to a testimony than just a story. 
um, may God bless the work that you are trying to do. Um, a few reflections uh, from me. Um, this, these are not necessarily questions or they don't necessarily need a response, they are rhetoric. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm worried with the church that we are trying to present here. Um, it looks like this church that you just portrayed is more passionate about keeping itself pure than, by, than doing Jesus' way, where people are loved through and in their struggles. Um, I, 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 I use Jesus as my reference point because our interpretation of the Bible is subjective. You have used Bible text to mean something else. Somebody will use the same Bible text to refer to something else. But one thing that we cannot fight over is the example of Christ's life, how he related to different kinds of people. And I think that's where the, the, the church should get its matching orders. Um, the second thing is the church that you are talking about doesn't necessarily understand the complexities of human sexuality. We're assuming that we know. You'll be surprised that in this very group, we don't even know the differences between LGBTQIA. We don't know. We are all painting it with one same brush, and we are trying to, 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 we're trying to fix uh, what we think we know when we don't. That is why sometimes you find some people refer to this community as an issue, not as people. Yeah? Ah, this issue, these are an issue. Some people refer to them as a project, not necessarily as human beings, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, daddies, who are yearning for God and yearning to be loved. So I think it's important that we are careful that we don't paint the, the whole thing into an issue project, uh, whatever, or sexual orgy uh, kind of a thing. Um, then the last comment uh, is, is that, um, I think we also have to be balanced in the way we show our passion against uh, what is happening around us. Uh, I'm a father. I don't even know what my child is going to turn out to be. But one thing that I, one thing that I, I pray for is that the same comp Okay, um, I think you went off a bit. Is it just me? So all I'm saying is, let's, let's, oh, you lost me. Yes, we're back, we're back. Oh, yeah. No, I was, I was saying, um, my, my, at the end of the day, my, my prayer and my wish is, um, you know, as somebody commented in the comment section, that uh, the struggle that, that, that uh, the, this community is going through, you find that probably it's the struggle is not so much with their sexuality, but it's our our bigotry, our intolerance, our hate, all these toxic attitudes as a church coming from Christians who are supposed to exhibit Christ's love. That's where their struggle is to reconcile people who claim to be following God and the way they treat them. I think that's where the struggle is. We can spend time trying to fix people using verses, but there's nothing that would fix a person better than when you show that you love and you care for them. So, so I don't agree, Pastor, that there's too much love. There is, you're, you're, you're being indulgent. You're overly empathetic. I don't agree with that. That's what the world lacks, and that's why the church is disgusting uh, because of these uh, straight jacket attitudes. So, so, so that's where my concern is that we, as a church, we need to be a place where people feel loved in and through their struggles. If, if we should make it easier for people to meet Jesus. But if we start putting truth and rules and barriers and barricades, I'm telling you, this place, which we are saying the church, the church, is going to be disgusting and unchristlike. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your comment. We appreciate it. Um, just, um, just in passing, because we don't want to be talking to and fro, we want to give other people a chance. Uh, I believe we didn't have time. These two hours, it's not enough to go into uh, the theories of these sexual origins and complexities and the dynamics that um, people go into 
um, how people feel, what costed the causation theory and all those, just going into the complexity of it, of the sexuality. I have my notes here, but I didn't want to go into it because time doesn't allow us to do that. The, reason, the other reason I didn't go into that is that it doesn't matter what cost one to be in this category. What matters is that there's only one way out is Jesus, all right? Um, we have so many, many, many causes of people being homosexual, lesbians, intersex, transgender, that have many, they are countless. And if we name them down and try to investigate them, try to research them, we'll spend two days here. And then after spending two days here, it might not even help, but what helps is the way out. So if it was a conference for two days, we'll go into that. So, but then here we just wanted to lift up a way out, which is what, which is Jesus. All right. And then lastly, uh, I just want to comment on saying that we mustn't speak of the truth more, we must speak, love the people more. I believe uh, I spoke about that. Maybe you were not on the platform. I said the church must love the people of God and then they must use grace and truth, but then they must be balanced. And then we must be, and then you said, oh, being over sympathetic, people, the church must be over sympathetic. You are saying they must not be over sympathetic. All right, I was saying we must not be over, over sympathetic. And I gave an example. I said, over sympathetic, it is when you feel the weakness of somebody else, all right? And then they are weak and then they go and commit sin again and again and again. They continue sinning again and again and again. And then you give them a leeway. You don't tell them the truth about their sin because you are saying, I'm being sympathetic. I'm being sorry for them. Let me, let me be sympathetic and not tell them the truth of the way. All right, it is possible to love somebody, to love them genuinely, yet telling them the truth. Tell them that the word of the Lord says that to a man to lay with another man is a sin, but we still love you. We still accept you. We are here for you. We'll walk with you. We'll be with you all the way till the end of the world until you get out of this. But then we mustn't compromise on the word of the Lord that I said, but then the issue of being over sympathetic and giving people a leeway to sin in the name of understanding. It's where the church must not go to. That will not help the church. We just make the church to be a house of uh, another house, just another house. So the truth must be held and love must be held, but they must be balanced. All right, thank you so much. Um, thanks so much, Nafila, for that answer. And maybe just uh, as a follow-up question, um, in your own experience, um, obviously your love for God was the, was the driving force, right? But how did you feel? Like, um, did you ever get to a point where you came out to the people around you about your struggles? Um, and uh, did you feel like the church was a place for you where you could come out um, as uh, somebody who struggled with homosexuality? And uh, when you, if you did uh, have that opportunity, how were you received? And does that uh, fit into uh, what you know made you maybe uh, you know stop struggling with the, with the whole thing, or was it difficult for you? All right, well, thank you so much. Um, all right, okay. To answer your question directly, um, as I said, that it was back in those times, maybe uh, twenty years back or so. Yeah, it was a long time ago. So at that time. I cannot accuse the church because I will be wrong to accuse the church. The church was not exposed to this, as in socially as well. It's not only the church, but even the people outside church, they were not that exposed to this. So if the, the people outside the world are not exposed, even the church won't be that much exposed. So then I knew that because there's no exposure. And then because of that lack of exposure, well, they don't talk much about it or deal with it deeply i cannot accuse them i will be unfair to accuse them all right then what i did somehow the lord gave me wisdom of just to find a way by myself and just searching the scriptures praying reading searching and searching the lord until i i, I got a place where the lord helped me all right yes then the second question you said and it's very important to know that I didn't accuse the church because we mustn't always accuse the church where the church is falling short. We must look into why is it falling short? Are the times allowing? Today is when maybe we can say the church is not trying hard because we have been overly exposed. So we must equip ourselves as a church as we are equipping ourselves today. All right. Okay. And then um, the issue of telling someone, no, I didn't tell anyone because 
I didn't think anybody will understand. I just had God. God was my friend. He was a friend that's closer than a brother. He was just my friend, just who knew what I was going through. And then the Lord was just helping me that just, just one or two friends knew about that. Just one or two friends who were very close that we were praying about that. And they really accepted me. And then they really, um, they really worked with me and they really showed me the love of the Lord in that regard. And I thank God for that because even if, even if it was at that time, there was just a remnant that the Lord separated that can be able to walk with you in love, all right? And then for today is a different story. Um, as a church, we need to equip ourselves uh, with what it's needed, um, with everything, because we didn't touch everything today, like uh, the causative theories, everything, and we keep ourselves as a church so that when people come to us, we have almost all the answers, not all the answers, we won't have all the answers, almost all the answers, all right? Almost all the answers be able to help the person to be in a better place. And if your church is not exposed, then it is upon you to do something about it, to go and learn, to go and teach yourself, to go and join a pastor who's more knowledgeable and learn and equip yourself and then come to your church and teach your church. And then I want to say, avoid this thing of blaming a church for not knowing. They don't know. Go and teach yourself and come and teach them. And improve your church than blaming them, pointing fingers at them. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to uh, take a fun here, and then we're going to go through the comment section. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hi. Um, uh, I got a bit uh, confused. When I saw the poster, I thought, uh, uh, please uh, don't take offense at this, and uh, I hope no one else, no one takes offense at this. When I saw the poster, I thought uh, it was a someone who was gay that was going to present to us. And then uh, when you started presenting, I thought, oh no, this person isn't. And then came the the questions and then you answered that question again. So you've basically covered a lot of questions that I had before. So I'm going to speak of uh, an encounter. I've got uh, a few individuals that would not be wrong to say that they are friends of mine because uh, they're gay friends of mine, basically. And uh, now, these, uh, there's one in particular that I traveled with. Uh, we went uh, on a trip to, uh, we went on a trip to some country. We traveled a, a very long distance. And uh, while traveling with them, I decided to ask them a couple of questions that I would, uh, that I've been dying to ask uh, people that are, basically gay in an environment where they would not feel uh, uh, confronted, basically. And uh, I've done this to two uh, in uh, particular. And uh, this one and both of them all say to me that uh, Christians are the most judgmental people. And uh, it's difficult for them to uh, become Christian because of the treatment they get, especially from us Christians. When they walk into church, it's the look. When they sit down in, um, in, um, in groups, when they try to sit in a group, people walk away from them one by one. When, they, when there's discussions, uh, people, they can actually feel that people are holding back. And as soon as they stand up to go to the bathroom or something, people get excited, they all uh, chit chatting. And when they come back, they're, they're silent again. Now, it's uh, difficult for the church to reach out to uh, these people because of the way we treat them even silently. And it's going to be a difficult for us in future to, 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 to reach out to them 
even when the laws uh, start protecting them, uh, uh, protecting them because of our behavior, it's going to be difficult for those to be sympathetic to us. Now, uh, when we were in this uh, certain uh, village, uh, people started uh, hurling insults at us and uh, him because uh, they could see uh, they could see that they, they they were gay. They started hurling insults at them, and uh, at some even wanted to to attack us because uh, we were walking with them. And some of the people that were there were actually in uniform, a church uniform. I'm not going to uh, mention names. Now, if this person, if how, how do we end up uh, going to this person and convincing them that uh, Jesus is the way, and yet the people that are supposed to be for Jesus are treating them like this? Uh, I was also in a group, a certain uh, WhatsApp group. Then on this group here, there's an individual that posts verses every morning. Now, on a certain day, uh, there was a gay person that posted something. I don't recall what it was, but uh, it, it, the post suggested that they were gay. And then there were three or four individuals that quickly said the person must be removed from the group. Now I stood up and uh, defended that the person's post. And I said that uh, there's been uh, verses posted. This is a business group. There's been someone posting verses and it's not related to the group. It's uh, not uh, the, the group related. They've been posting verses every morning. No one complains. But today, because this guy has posted. Why is everyone up in arms? If this person should be removed, I, I need to protect this person's right to post that because uh, tomorrow it is going to be me who is going to be bullied out of, out, out of this. They, uh, and uh, to this day, that person has been uh, kept in the, in, in the group. I, it does not mean that I subscribe to whatever they believe. No, it is just the unfair treatment that they should not be, be getting. And the sad truth is that they even getting it in our church. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, you're, you're done, eh? Hello. I think he's done, yes. Oh, he's done, all right, okay, great. Um, just a quick comment, then we go to the next thing. Um, yes, thank you for your comment. Um, I just uh, first a uh, comment that you raised that you thought the person who was coming here was homosexual and then you realized, oh no, it's not, it's fine. No, it is fine. No, no offense about that, no offense about that. The love of God reigns in this place. The love of God reigns in this place even whatever it said, the love of God is cushioning us. Yes, uh, it boils back even to what I've said when I spoke that we don't need a person who has experienced what you experienced for them to speak. If you are having depression and God sends somebody who is happy to give you a word of encouragement, receive that word because it's the word that encourages you. If you are a poor man and God sent a rich man to give you a word about being rich, receive it. Don't say I need a poor, a poor man to come and teach me. No, don't go there. So you, as I said, to demand a person with the same testimony to teach you, it's not a biblical principle, all right? But then testimonies are very, very important. They are important. They are there to confirm the scripture, but they are not there to establish the scripture. They're not there to establish the word. So may we take that home saying, whoever encourages us, let's not force our way and say, no, don't talk because you didn't experience it. That is not the way we do things in the kingdom. All right, and then I would like us to say that, um, I sympathize with those guys who were bullied that you spoke about, the guys that were bullied because of their sexual orientation and they were bullied by the church. I sympathize with that, that's very wrong. And then we really discourage that. I would like to say two things here. In the church, not everyone in the church is perfect that we must agree on. 
Not everybody in the church is perfect. Not everyone in the church is mature. So we'll always have those people who are immature and who are not loving enough, who are not like Christ that's in the church, who are imperfect. And these people, they will be the one who are bashing uh, the homosexual people, the gay people, the lesbians, and uh, the other alphabet. They'll be bashing them. They'll be discriminating. They will be doing hate crime and hate speech from the church, these people. And then because they are doing it from the church, then the community out, outside, they will just put a blanket over it and say, the church is abusing us. But then the truth is that there's another group that is mature, that loves people. They love the people of God. They love gays, lesbians, and everybody. And then they never name call. They never commit hate crimes, hate speech. They never do those things. They really take care of the people of God. Homosexual, they feel free in their, in their presence. They feel at home in their presence. They feel loved and they receive them in their home. They receive them for tea and coffee. They are relaxed. But then this group, they, never, they are never talked about. The LGTPI community, they never said, but in the church, I've met another brother or another mother who treated me well. I've met another pastor who treated me well. They never speak about that. If they do, it's really, and they don't speak about it loud, but they speak about this one who are patient. But then the people of God, let's agree that we'll always have this immature group until Jesus comes, we'll have it. So we'll never have a perfect church because we are still in this world. That's why the Lord is saying that he, he, the judgment will start in the house of the Lord to judge people who are immature, who are not grown in the level where they should grow in. So let's agree that, okay. We have this group and then this group that treating people right. Yes, they might not recognize you. Not, they might not recognize us for the good work that we are doing, for being loving, for being kind, for being accepted. It's fine. Continue doing it. Continue doing it. And I want to tell you that in my personal capacity, I have many friends who are not born again, all right, who are not born again, who are uh gays like who are homosexual they 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 practice that they are for that all right they are all the way for that but we are friends we sit together we eat together we we, we fellowship together in tea and coffees we we, 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 we we they are relaxed in my presence and they, they don't feel judged they don't feel shamed they don't feel condemned in my presence they feel like i'm their brother because I love them, I care for them. At the same time, I'm loving them, I'm caring for them, yet they know the truth. I've told them the truth once to say, I stand for one, two, three, and then the word of God says one, two, three. I say it once, I don't say it every time we are out for coffee. That's where believers go wrong. So when you're having a brother in your home, maybe it's your own sibling who's homosexual, or you're having a colleague at work, or you're having a friend who's homosexual, who's a lesbian, who's a transgender, tell them once or twice, all right, what you stand for, what the Bible says, tell them that they should repent. If they don't understand that, if they reject that, leave it. Don't bash it every day when you are with them and weary them down. Say it once and then other times just go with them for coffee, invite them to your house, love them, go to parties with them, but uphold the scriptures while you are loving them and do that consistently. Over a period of time, they will come to the Lord because they see that you told them the truth, but then you are loving them. As I am doing with many uh, homosexual friends that I have. And I know that someday they will get to know the Lord and their personal savior. And then lastly, we have still homosexuals struggling in the church who are finding help, who are finding brothers and sisters who love them, who don't judge them, who don't shame them, but speaking the truth to them, who are working with them. Like I work with many people who are struggling. They feel loved. They don't feel judged. They don't feel shamed. They don't feel condemned. They feel accepted. Like they feel like this is our brother, this is our friend. And then they are born again. They're walking through a journey of um, being processed out. So I want to say that, yes, there is that caliber in the church that is loving, that is accepting, that, that is raising grace, that is merciful. Yes, the world might not shout about this group and shout about the one who, who are bashing, but rest assured, this group is there. May you be that group. May you be that group. I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Kulu Fellow. Uh, so what we're going to do now, because I see there's a lot of hands and we haven't even started with the comment section. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take about four or five hands. So if you maybe have a pen or a paper just to write down some of the questions as they say it, uh, then you'll answer after maybe the fifth person and then we will do the comments after that. Would that be fine? Yes, it is fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Kumalo, I'm going to unmute you now.
<clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right, no, thanks, thanks uh, for, for the presentation. I think on the alphabet, we must, we must add the letter A for adulterers. Because um, <clears throat> I think this has to do um, this has to do with sexual sins, I think. So also people who like to sleep with different partners, they must be added, married people. I think um, they must also have <coughs> adulterers coming out as, <coughs> as a community as well, since we're dealing with sin. My second thing is on, <coughs> my second comment is on Oguti. <laughs> Yeah, it's for if one get us as well because it's about sin. My second thing, I don't know. If there's a question or what? I want to understand how far does it go? <clears throat> this homosexual thing. How far does it go? I mean, suppose married people they do the. I don't know either how to. I don't know that there are kids here. Yeah. Like the blow job, um, they do the licking of each other. Um, <clears throat> some they even go further to anal sex. But they are married people, it's a husband and a wife. Um, does that count as homosexuality or what? Um, if yes, then I think. Um, must have a lot of people coming out so that they can also find help as well. And how can we help them? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I hope you, you took note of that question. Miss Dube, I'm unmuting you. Okay, San Um. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna start by saying this. In my understanding, well, in, in the defense rather of, of people who are not um, easily accepting, Lendo, when it came, my figure, it wasn't, I wanna put it in a way that we're gonna understand. It wasn't a black thing, right? Um, there, there wasn't even, uh, I think, it wasn't there. So, it my color. We, we saw it on TV, seeing it in the Western countries, right? And then Gujuti Labo, who were struggling um, in our black community, then started, you know, trying to come out. Probably they were there. It's just that maybe they, they, they couldn't, I don't know. We, I'm trying to, to put it in a way, maybe from my understanding, right? Gujuti, Maybe it was there, but they couldn't come out because we, we they didn't really, I don't know, maybe understand it themselves because as in twenty indo da indo umfaz umfaz, we understand. But then again, obviously with time we, we got to know. I feel it's very unfair for anyone to think oh, people are being homophobic towards uh, uh, people who identify as gays or lesbians, because we some of these things are scissors, we didn't understand it and we didn't know. I mean, even if I've, I've seen the word LGBTQ, I, I cannot tell you what it stands for, right? Because I've felt like, hey, yeah, okay. I don't wanna be told which I'm judgmental, na 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 na. So anyway, moving on from there, my question then to you is, how do we then love the sinner and not the sin? In the event that we, we're dealing with individuals who, who identify as, as either gay or lesbian, how do I love the lady and not what she is doing, right? How, how can I separate like action that shows that I love you, but I am not for what you are doing, right? Because God says, this is not right. And then one last thing, there's a story that I, I read about. I'm not so sure if I read it or, or saw it on YouTube, but Kunum Dwana who was born, um, this kid had two parts, two genital parts. One was of a female half, she was female half, she was male, right? 
or she had two parts, I think, something like that. So uh, the doctor suggested and says, no, let's give her time, Gutakule, maybe a year or two years. Then, then we are going to test her and see if she ident identifies more with males or identifies more with females like Nama hormones. And then the, the part which identifies more, the hormones which identify more, more will cut the other one out so that I, I, I call it a leogen. The child came to that age of about two years, they, the child was identifying more in a hormones, amadota, right? And then they, they cut out the female part. But later on when that child grew, and I was six, seven, the child now started exhibiting more of the female parts that she no longer has, right? So in the case of people like that, that we have in the church, how, how then do we deal with it? Because there, there's layer of others maybe who, who choose to do that or whatever the case, but layer is a situation where the child did not have a choice um, in what happened to her now. At the time, Akula, the, the body said, you are a man. And growing up six, seven years now, she's more of a female than a male. How then do we help as a church in, in do we pray that God, I don't know, what, what do we do? Because Lomtwana didn't choose to be where they are. Um, the decision was taken by the doctors and the parents, right? So how do we help? I think in Tanduk Pereirap. Thank you so much, Ms. Dewey, uh, for your question. I hope uh, Kulufelo, you took note. Uh, of that. Um, guys, may we please be respectful as possible when people are airing their views, right? You may think you're right. You may think the next person is wrong, uh, but we can do this uh, maturely. We can do this like people who are intellectuals, people who actually think and reason. Let's not find ourselves insulting the next person's intelligence. It's, it's, it's really uncalled for. And I hope that uh, it won't lead to us having to make people exit because we do not tolerate such behavior here. Okay, I will unmute Anthony. Hi, happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I hope that you're all doing well. Yeah, so um, I, was, I was listening to the conversation and I found it quite interesting. I think there's a couple of dangerous things that have been said in this, in this conversation. I think um, the first one was from Admiral Nube, where he said like, um, well, you know, scripture is subject to our own interpretation and so therefore we all have different opinions on scriptures but I think that's a really dangerous comment to make because we can't say there are there are verses where God is very specifically clear on what he says so the first one is that God says that neither adulterers nor fornicators nor homosexuals nor sodomites will enter the kingdom of heaven that's not a private interpretation. God is being very clear that if you practice certain lifestyles, you are not getting into the kingdom. And so I don't, I don't think, I think the problem is that a lot of comments have been made today and they've been based on the fact of, oh yeah, but you know, gay people act this way oh, or straight people act this way, but it's not about how people act in terms of what their opinions are. God's opinion is the only one that matters. And I think that's what our brother was exp explaining. So no scripture is subject to private interpretation. Yeah, we, we know if we look at Sodom and Gomorrah, we know what went down in Sodom and Gomorrah. The word sodomy comes from Sodom and Gomorrah. So we know what happened there. We know God's views on that. Is Sodom and Gomorrah still existing? No. So I have gay friends. Yeah, I have gay friends. I'm in the UK. I have gay friends. One of my best friends is a gay person. Yeah. I am SDA. One of my best friends is a gay person. Do I agree with his lifestyle? No, I don't. And I make that very clear to him. I say, dude, yeah? Like, you know I don't agree with your lifestyle. He got married. I didn't go to the wedding. He didn't even invite me because he knew my opinion. But that doesn't mean that I don't love him as a brother. It doesn't mean that I don't care about him as a person. I still respect him. And on judgment day, I do share scriptures with him on judgment day. He cannot say to the Lord, well, you know, Anthony never told me about, about this going against your word. 
So he's he's very, very clear on that. Also, as well, we need to call out sin by its name. Yeah. Like if something is a sin, it's a sin. I'm, I'm not just saying this when it comes to gay people. I've got friends that are players as well. I've got friends that are players. When they are players, I say, dude, I do not agree with your lifestyle. Male and female players, I do not agree with what you're doing. It's not right. But calling out sin by its name is important. John the Baptist got beheaded for calling out sin. Should we not do it because we're scared of what people think? No, we still need to do it. And also on the, on the subject of someone said um, that gay people were being bullied. There's bullies on both sides. For example, let's, let's, let's go into the whole bullying side of it. In Florida right now, they have put a case forward where they have rejected the LGBT agenda, which is they want children as young as seven to be taught about homosexuality and testing whether someone is gay. Um, it, this is something that parents have said, look, I don't want schools teaching my children about being gay or asking my child if they're being gay. That's my right. I have a, child, a right to raise my child the way I raise my child. So also, when we're talking about bullying, let's look at the fact that now women are now competed against by men. Yeah? I, I know they raised it earlier on, but that is a mafia on its own. The fact that a woman can train for years and years and years in her sport, and then a man comes along and decides, right, I want to race as a woman, and they'll swim as a woman, and they're all getting gold medals. That is not fair on, on women at all. So we also see as well that um, there's, there's a woman that Tucker Carlson interviewed this week, and her story is quite interesting because when she was growing up, she was basically told that she was trans, you know, because she had certain characteristics about her. I think we, we, we I believe we call it the tomboy, the tomboy age where certain ladies, like young girls, sometimes a lot of the time because they're raised in a house full of men, they tend to kind of be kind of tomboyish. But later on, they come out of that. She was told from a young age, no, you must be trans. So she started to dress as, as a man and stuff like that. Fortunately for her, later on, she realized, actually, I'm not trans. It was just me being a tomboy. It's something that I was going through. Her name is Helena Kirshner. So if you Google Tucker Carlson, Helena Kirshner, it will come up. But imagine the people that have gone through penectomies. So I, for those of us that don't know what penectomy is, it's when you have your penis removed because you believe that, you know, you, you are a trans woman. So you have your penis removed or you have a mastectomy. So you have your breasts removed. So you've got people who are then in their 20s and 30s who realize, actually, I didn't want to be a woman. That was I was being, you know, told certain things that I, I, I was not fully aware of. So we need to be very careful to not push anything except God's word. And God's word is very specific. Like, yes, the church can be judgmental. Yes, the way we treat homosexuals is, you know, it's not acceptable because there are people that are fornicating and there are people that are doing all sorts of things. They're beating up their wives, blah, 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 blah. But that does not take away the fact that the Bible is very clear that on judgment day, homosexuals, sodomites, fornicators, adulterers will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That is not being homophobic. That is God's word, point blank. So we need to respect that. And we need, we need to also avoid saying, well, you know, how you view the Bible is how you view the Bible. Because as Adventists, we hear that all the time. When we talk about Sunday worship with people and we say Sunday's not the Sabbath, they go, ah, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's your view of scripture. But that's not our view of scripture. That's God's view. So let's be careful to kind of respect that. Thank you so much, Anthony, for, for that. And I just want to highlight on something that you mentioned that sometimes bullying can be on both sides, right? Uh, there are some people who are sort of also bullied into uh, identifying themselves as homosexuality, maybe because of the way they speak or the way they, they look. People tend to make comments that sometimes drive people to that. So humans in general are full of sin. So that's the, 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 the core thing that we're struggling with right across. And this is why we are coming up with all these uh, hate speeches and all these things that 
now become a problem when people are trying to navigate through life. So thank you for that, Anthony. Uh, your the audience is very impressed with your with your accent, just to put it out there. Um, I will now have Yolanda. I'm going to ask to unmute you. Please unmute yourself. Oh, hi, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. All right. Uh, thank you, Kulufelo, for the wonderful presentation and uh, the organizers. Thank you guys for this. Most of my questions we answered during the presentation. Uh, although I just have one question. Um, it also has to do with Ms. Dube, I uh, had to say. Um, the I in the LGBTQI uh, plus community. Um, I feel like, I mean, when someone is born in intersex, you are born that way. You didn't choose to be like that, you know, uh, which goes on to like the intersexual. So, I mean, the moment someone says LGBTQ, someone thinks of, I am a demon. <laughs> they think of that, but then with that particular eye, you are born that you are born that way. And why is it that intersexuals um, they usually find themselves uh, they find home in that uh, community and not in churches? You know, I'm not sure if we are ignorant of such people or we are not aware. But then such people exist, you know, at times someone is born that way, at times um, such parts, um, they develop, maybe you were born a female, but later on you develop a male a genital, you know. So um, I'm just, I just want to know why is it that um, they find a home in the LGBTQI community and not at church. And I would also like to know what the Bible has to say about such people, what the Bible has to say about them. And um, one person once said, I mean, Miss Duba was like, they decided to cut the other genital thinking it's the dominant one. And later on, they discovered that um, the girl child, um, she was, I don't know which gender, she, which gender, yeah. She was now the other gender, the, the part that they cut out is what she is actually is oh okay they whatever they pronoun please forgive me for the pronouns and this other lady i know of was like they also cut one of her of their genitals <laughs> and then later on i mean in life they've been having problems now and then they have to go to the gynecologist because of that they ask questions like who are you to determine my gender I mean, if God so it tried for me to be born this way and you would change that, who are you? And I think I saw someone comment something about um, girls and boys toilets. It's just like that. I believe not everything is black and white. And that is why there are such people and where do such people belong? And um, are we welcoming that? I mean, those type of people and do we know of such people how do we treat them? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I, I've, I've just been going through the, the comment section as well. And um, I know that sometimes as, as, as common, you know, a discussion may not necessarily lead to where you may want it to as an audience. And maybe you may want to just share your views onto, you know, what you think and what you feel we are missing just so that we all feel included because no one must come out of this feeling like, you know, I didn't feel like I was hurt or I didn't feel like um, the, 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 the lesson was relevant for me. So I am just going to ask, um, is Theo in the audience? I'm just going to unmute you. Um, if you have any questions or any comments, I will, it's just to include all of us in the in the conversation if you're if you're okay with that. Okay, please unmute yourself.
Okay, I am not sure if uh, Theo is with us. Nonetheless, we shall pass on that. Uh, Black Mehmet, I will unmute you. Come in, guys. Afternoon. Thank you so much for please um, listen and uh, a partial testimony. His side, I understand we really not much on dwelling on the testimony, but more on the way out of. I don't know whether to call it a problem or, or, or sin or or what. So I'm, I'm mostly on the side. What what I wanted to say, I've mostly been covered by what and contribute, and as well as to say, um. Look at um the LGBT wara, wara, wara. It's 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 <laughs> has all of it in there, you know, and it's something that says God never created us and gave us a sin later on. All sins have been there from creation time. I mean, it's just how things have just differently changed. So for me, when I look at this LGBTI um, dilemma that we are faced with, it comes down to the beliefs that we have as different people. We have one Bible, but it goes back to say, in that one Bible, we have so many churches that still use that one Bible and still choose to interpret verses in their own ways. So as much as we have one Bible and people still need, still feel the need to interpret verses to suit what they want to achieve, there is little much that we can do about that. People will always interpret the Bible in their own different way to choose what they feel suits them or what they want in, in, in life. So if a thief wants to justify stealing, they'll simply tell you, so should I sleep hungry? when there's an unguarded house. So they will find scripture in the Bible to support that. And everyone else who's looking at it will know clear stealing is a sin. But they'll find verses from the very same Bible that says do not steal to justify what they want to believe. So our biggest problem is not as Christians, it's just as human beings. We want to recruit people to what we believe in. We are in a competition of being superior more than the other in what we have subscribed to. We have the Muslims. They have what they believe in. They know their own God and everything else. We have, we have the Catholics. I mean, okay, fine. Catholics are under Christians. We have um, the Chinese. We have the Hindus. We have, I mean, African pe people that believe in, in, in Izangoma and, you know, all those other things. People believe in different things in different places. And they will always stand firm in what they believe in. But the most important thing that we are taught as Christians, as the pastor said, is the part of love. If I respect you enough to love you, and in my love, I've got respect for you, what you believe in is not my problem. My problem is when you fail to have love and respect for me as a human being. So I think if all of us could be in a space as Christians or as whatever other denominations or beliefs, if we are able to all love each other and respect each other. LGBTIQ would never be a problem to us because it's not our problem. It's a sin that has always been there. We can't change anything about it. It's, it's as much as we can try to understand how it comes about to be or how it was invented or how it's spreading. It's not our problem. Our duty, our mandate is to love one another. I mean, we've heard. Um, the pastor's got friends that are gay and they still sit at the same table and be fine and eat from the same plate or something. And they're still okay with each other because they respect each other's beliefs. My problem comes when we try to recruit each other into other people's beliefs. Speak your truth and stand there. If someone hears it, it's a different story. If someone hears it and they love your truth, they'll come to you and say, tell me more about it. Hence, it is a personal 
it's a personal decision for someone who has been lesbian or gay to then say, listen, here, yeah, um, I think I've now found the truth and I will pursue the truth. And the decision waits with me and it stands with me. No matter how many times someone will tell you in your ears that this is wrong. If you haven't made that decision to change, you will never change if you've been hurt. You will never heal until you heal yourself. No matter how many times people say they are sorry, you will never heal yourself. So it goes back, the love, the respect. I think there we will really win. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kulufelo. I think we have given the audience enough airtime so you can just shed light on some of the questions and comments that were made. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for to everyone who have forwarded the comments and questions. Uh, all right, I'll just go through them quick. Uh, yes, uh, the first um, speaker mentioned that adultery should be included in this alphabet because it is a sexual sin. All right, the reason why it's not included, it is because it's not in the minority group. The, the alphabets, they are deemed that everyone in that group, they are in the minority. So they are the protected group, all right? Not that it's not a sin, okay? They are sinful. Some of the things that they are sinful, all right? But then adultery, it falls under general sin, just like um, homosexuality falls under general sin, lesbian uh, practice fall under general sin. They all fall under the umbrella of sinning as far as the Bible is concerned. But then we cannot insert adultery into that because it, it, it's not done in the minority. It's many people, everyone, everywhere they are committing adultery. Even the, L, the LGTB community, they commit adultery if they are married to one another, men and men, and then they're going to do adultery. So we cannot put it in that. That's why we have in that. It's about minority, my brave. It's about minority. And then the other thing I wanted to say earlier on is that they say they're in the minority, but my personal take is that currently today, they are not in the minority. They were in the minority maybe 20 years back, but not now. Why am I, am I saying that they are not in the minority today? It's because uh, they have lots and lots of money. There are lots and lots of billions of dollars which are being pumped into LGBTQ, um, LG, uh, sorry, community. The, the lot of billions are being pumped into that. Lots of companies are pumping money into this campaign. So they have lots of money. And if you have lots of money, you are not in the minority. You are just outnumbered. And being outnumbered doesn't mean you are in a minority because they have lots of money. And money gives you a muscle to do things, to move things, and things will move. So today, they are not in a minority. So that minority thing is just being used to bully us out of the way. So personally, I don't take it. I don't call the minority group currently because of the funds, billions of dollars which are pumped into their campaigns. All right, and then you spoke about the anal sex in heterosexual marriage. I believe you were mentioning a heterosexual marriage, saying if a man and a wife um, engage in anal sex, are they homosexual? No, they are not homosexual, they are not. That is what, that is what they prefer to do, all right? And then you asked, uh, if the Bible is condemning that, you ask if the Bible is condemning that. When we read in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it doesn't say anything about how we should have sex. It doesn't say that. It just say uh, we must have sex, but it doesn't give us any idea of how to have sex. But then I believe that the Lord then gives us the Holy Spirit inside of us, gives us a conscience that guides us on what to do, all right? So I will answer it like this. I won't say the Bible said, because I will be lying. I'll say the conscience inside of the person of the Holy Spirit will tell you if that anal sex is sin or not when you are doing it with your husband or with your wife. So if you are saying the Holy Spirit says it's yes, it's you and your Holy Spirit. But as far as I'm concerned, from where I'm coming from, my conscience says no, the Holy Spirit says no, but I cannot put a scripture on it. And I honor the authority of the Holy Spirit as well, as our guide. So it boils back to the Holy Spirit, your relationship with the Holy Spirit, your conscience as well. So it's not something that we can really, really uh, pin down onto the scripture, but a general impression of the Bible can guide us into that. All right. And then the speaker number two, um, 
they mentioned that is Mrs. Dube, if I'm not um, wrong, uh, she said that um, homosexuality originally or back in the days was not a black thing. It was a thing from white people. Um, I would like to say that's not necessarily true because homosexuality, a lesbian, all these alphabets, they are spiritual conditions. Yes, they manifest themselves anatomically, physiologically, psychologically. They, they manifest themselves in that way, but they have their spiritual origin because they are spiritual things. And then in the spirit, there's no black or white. In the spiritual, there's no black person, there's no white person, there's no Indian, there's no Chinese. The spiritual matters are spiritual. And if a certain thing is attacking you in the spirit, it doesn't respect your color. So this homosexuality, it doesn't respect anyone's color. So it's not that it came with the white or whatever. From the very beginning, whether white, black, Chinese, brown, all of us, we struggled with these issues. The issue might be who came out first. And it's not about coming out because coming out doesn't mean that the one who's not coming out is not struggling. Yes, many didn't come out because they didn't have money to come out. They didn't have resources to come out. They didn't have the strength and confidence and boldness to come out. But that doesn't mean that they didn't struggle. As the word of the Lord says that there's nothing new under the earth. All right. So nothing new under the earth pertaining to blacks and white. So let's not pin it to any other culture. We are all fallen and we're in. We are short of God's glory. I'm a black person, I have fallen, I'm short of God's glory. A white person is short of God's glory. We all need God in this issue. So it's not a black or white thing. And then the second thing that uh, Mrs. Dube said, it was about um, okay, assigning um, the, the sex change, doing a sex change for a child who's born um, with maybe two genitals or maybe they are, they, are, they, are, they are born with a penis, but then find that they have some uterus, they have some fallopian tubes, and then there's some discrep discrepancy right there. Um, then she said, how do we determine the sex on that child? Because some other people find that they assign them to another gender. Then when they grow up, they're 16, they're 20 years, then you find that they, they feel like they are that gender that was removed or they are that sex that was removed. How do we assign a gender then? All right. Um, in terms of intersex, we know that it is, um, is a matter of chromosomal abnormalities and hormonal abnormalities. All right. And then we know that um, for it to be changed, we need uh, two things. Surgical reconstruction, where they will look, they'll do chromosomal studies and hormonal studies. Then the one that it's more, then the child will be assigned to that or the person will be assigned to that. All right. And um, the most important one it is spiritual discernment which us as believers, we do have. You can actually pray about it. If you have a child and then they, they you have a child and they, they are born intersexed, you can say, Lord, I have this child before me. Um, please reveal to me what gender is this child? Because now it seems like um, the child have two genitals. I don't know if he's a male or female. Lord God, you know this child and you have a purpose about this child. You have a purpose about this child, please tell me. The Lord will reveal it in your heart about the child. I have another pastor who was called in this issue because the parents, they had, inter they had a child who was intersex. Then they said, Pastor, please pray and, ask, and just hear with us from the Lord. And the Lord really told them what the child is and then they cut out the sex that was not and then the child grew up to be that person because they heard from the Lord. So you can hear the Lord. So I, I recommend that you hear from the Lord about your child. And then you do that later and do sexual, a surgical sexual reconstruction. And then the third question that she asked was saying that uh, you can do this reconstruction, but then later on you find that, oh, they've chopped out the part that was the real me. What do we do there? We can do a secondary, um, secondary uh, surgical reconstruction again. We can chop and then fix things if they are fixable because some other things will not be fixable, but then we can bring it closer to that place. We can bring you closer to that place, all right? Even though not totally, because you'll not be totally uh, 100% into the category of a male or a female, but you'll be brought somewhere closer. So that secondary uh, reconstruction and spiritual discernment as well, all right? And then um, I just wanna even interlink it with another speaker who asked, if a child is born with, uh, I believe it was a third speaker, she asked, uh, with the fourth speaker, she asked if a child or anyone is born intersex, 
Is it normal? Is it sinful? Uh, who do we condemn? What do we say in that instance? Do we say this is abnormal? Do we say this is sinful? All right. I, I, I'm a medical doctor, all right? I'm a medical doctor by profession, yes. And then I will tell you that, I'll make an example about the cases that we see in pediatrics, all right? Um, you find that a child is born with Down syndrome. Okay, when a child is born with Down syndrome and is presented to you, this child didn't choose to have Down syndrome. They were born with it, all right? And then as they were born with it, we cannot say the child is normal by the reason that they were born with it. And that's where most homosexuals get it wrong. They say, because I was born this way, it means it must be normal. If we go with the reasoning that if we are born with something, then that's something, it's normal. Then you must call a Down syndrome normal. You must call cerebral palsy child normal. You must call a child with a floppy syndrome normal. Those children are not normal when we are dealing with pediatrics. They are not normal and they need help. They need multidisciplinary multi help, all right? So because they are born with that and then they are not normal and they will need help to bring, them, to, bring, to bring them closer to normality, to bring them closer to normality. So even this child who was born with an intersex, they have two genitals, they have the uterus and then they have a penis, are they normal? They are not normal. All right, that's, a no, that's not a normal way a person should come. All right, then the second question, is it sinful? No, there's no sin there. It's just anatomical uh, 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 distortion. There's no sin, it's just that they're abnormal, but there's no sin in their intersex, so they are not normal. So if something is not normal, what do we do? We do surgical correction, whether be it um, Down syndrome, be it uh, uh, whatever, a condition the child comes with, we do correction where correction is needed and where correction is possible. So this intersex child, number one, is not normal. We are not condemning the child. Please let's not throw the card of condemning. No, they are not normal because having two genitals is not normal. But then we can bring them closer to normality. Another question, is there a sin there? No, they are not sinful. And then God accept them. We accept them as a church. There, there's no sin in that. They are just abnormal. And then we'll bring them closer to normality by surgical construction. Surgical construction. All right. So, so, if I can just connect it to homosexuality. Now, again, we, we spoke about intersex. It's abnormal, but then it's not sinful. But then, when we come into the issue of homosexuality, all right, then a person will say, "I was born this way." Why do we tell you they were born this way? Because when they were coming of age, when they were realizing themselves sexually, is that is the only thing they knew. When they woke up, they woke up with the same sex feeling that I'm attracted to boys, I'm attracted to girls. It's what they knew their whole life. Hence they say they were born that way, all right? And then there are many theories of, co of causative, theories that tell us, that tells us what causes homosexuality, what causes lesbianism, what causes transgender. There are many theories. I don't want to go into that and there's no time to go into that. All right, but then I want to say that, um, let's say for argument's sake, okay, they were born that way, all right? They were born that way, all right? Let's say they were born that way because other people say, no one is born homosexual, you are born into it, meaning that circumstances of life shape you into a homosexual, into a lesbian. Then others say, no, circumstances don't shape you. You are born in your mother's womb with chromosomes that with chromosomes and genes and hormones that lead you to homosexuality. There are many theories into that, all right? For argument's sake, let's say, all right, we agree that, okay, they were born that way, they have a chromosomal issues that makes them to be homosexual. Then we'll ask ourselves, is that normal? It's not normal according to scriptures because the scriptures said God created men and women, he and she, all right? And then when a person is born not being normal, there must be help to help them to bring into man to normality. Like a Down syndrome child, like a child with a cerebral palsy, like a floppy child who is born right here, we do help them to bring them to normality. So even this one who argues that I was born into it, it's not normal, but you must be brought to normality. And then if we stick it out, if we argue and say, no, it's normal, it's, therefore it's right. Therefore, if you say it's normal, let's leave it like that. And then it's right. And it means God accepted. Then you must accept a Down syndrome child and not have that child, if you have that child. You must accept a floppy child, you must accept cerebral palsy child and not do nothing for that child because God wants them like that. If they were born like that, you see, it doesn't hold water, but we are moving from that one, all right? And um, 
the, the last thing about this intersex, uh, the, the, the fourth speaker mentioned and said, and asked the question, why are the intersex people finding community in the LGTP community? Why are they finding community there? Why are they finding acceptance there? All right, they find acceptance there in that minority group because they are a minority. It boils back to minority. They feel like we're in the minority. We are up against the heterosexual population. Therefore, the group that we can join is this minority group. Let me tell you the truth. It's not that they are loved in that minority group. No, 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 no. no. It's not that they are loved. And let me tell you one thing that you should know. In that minority group of LGBTQI community, as it is, they look like they are loving each other. They look like they are tight. They look like they, they love each other. I'm telling you, they don't love each other um, the way we think they do. They are just united against us. I'll say that again. They don't love each other as we think they do. They are just united against the church. And then if the church is taken out of the way, like during rapture, when we will be taken out of the way, they will fight against each other because there's no one to unite against. There's no love in there. There's no love. Don't be deceived. It's just unity against something. When we are taken out of the way as a church, the real colors will be seen. So to, con to conclude um, what my sister said, that they find community, the, the intersex find community in the LGBTQI community. Us as believers, now that we are knowledgeable, now that we are educated, now that we have been exposed, we must be active in accepting the, the intersex. We must be active in helping the parents who have such children and helping our friends and include them in and loving them in and drawing them in and really supporting them and really covering them. Now that we know, Yes, maybe in the past it was a problem because we were not exposed, but today we know we will do better. And I'm appealing to the men and women on this platform, be that man who will accept them, be that man who will bring a change and that we stop blaming the church without us doing anything. So if you do something, I do something, then the church is improving gradually. Then the, the, last, the last comment, it was, uh, yes, the last comment, it was of Anthony. Thank you so much, Anthony, for confirming everything I've said. Thank you so much that there's somebody on this platform who respect authority of scripture because I spoke strongly about the authority of scripture that the scripture is the final authority on this issue of LGG, LG, L, LB, LG, PGQI community is the final authority and we stand by it. And then when we say a man must not lie with a man, a woman must not lie with a woman, and then that's what the scripture says, and we stand by it. Is we stand there, we are not judging people. It's what the scripture says. I'm glad that uh, there's somebody who endorses that in that platform as well. So thank you for that. And I would like to say on that that we have no private interpretation of scripture, no private interpretation. Scripture must interpret scripture. What do we mean by scripture interpreting scripture? Okay, we have Romans one, which says that um, men lying with another man and women lying with another woman. You don't put your meaning into that. That means exactly what it says. Men lying with another man and women lying with another woman. Even a six-year-old child can understand that. He doesn't need you to have a, a degree in English to understand that. It's just pure as it says. Even in Sipedi, Musadi wa robale musadi, monna wa robale monna. It doesn't need any, any explanation. Then you go to Lifitikas. Then Lifitikas must explain Romans 1. Then Lifitikas explains Romans 1. Then Lifitikas says God detests when a man lies with another man, as in with a woman. So Lefiticus is explaining Romans 1. Romans 1 is explaining Lefiticus. And then it's a scripture explaining scripture. I haven't put my thought into it. So there's no private inter interpretation. Is what we mean by scripture interpreting scripture. And then you go to Corinthians. Then to Corinthians as well, it says, uh, those who practice homosexuality, they will not enter into the kingdom of God. Then Corinthians is interpreting Romans 1. Romans 1 interpreting Lefiticus. No thought of cool fellow. No opinion of mine, no private interpretation. It's just the Bible as it is. That's how we should interpret the Bible. So the notion that uh, the Bible is subjective, the different interpret, no, that is not true and we should not subscribe to that. What will help you is that you must allow the scripture to interpret the scripture. If the scripture is difficult, if one verse is difficult, don't understand it, find other scripture that can illuminate that verse and you won't be wrong. You'll always hold in the true authentic word of God at the same time. And then lastly, 
uh, just speaking on of bullying. Thank you so much, Anthony, for mentioning bullying as well. That bullying is on both sides. I've mentioned that as well. I've said earlier on when I was doing my presentation, I said this community of homo homosexuality, lesbian, and, 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 and transgenders, they are bullies. And I will say that again on these cameras. They are bullies as well. Not all of them. Not all of them. Some of them, they are bullies. Because I said when I was presenting earlier on that, they will teach your kids in, 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 in their school that there are two mummies and there are two daddies. And they will teach a child that, all right, without a parent's permission. How do you do that? How do you teach a six-year-old that there are two daddies and two mummies? You must accept that without consulting a parent. That's bullying. They are bullying their way into our children. And we should not accept that because they use a homophobic card. When you say, no, don't teach my child that at school, they say you're homophobic. And then they want to silence you. They want to put a tape by saying you're homophobic. You are not homophobic. You are the weight feeling. You love the weight. You are the person of the weight. You uphold the weight. You uphold the high standard of the weight. No one should silence you. No one should bully you. As long as you're speaking the word of God and the truth in love, with love, with love, with love, with love, and accepting the people. And then lastly, on that, on the part of love, then another person asked to say, how do we then um, work with these people? It boils back to what I have said, that when you're having a homosexual friend, tell them once or twice what God says, that God loves you. God wants you to repent. God wants you to be saved and God hates homosexual act, all right? And then leave it. Don't say it every day when you are meeting for coffee. Then next time when you meet for coffee, talk about weather, talk about politics, talk about work, talk about their family every day when you are meeting. Don't repeat it. Don't re when you repeat it, then you become abusive because you said it once, the Lord will work on it. So don't, you don't have to repeat it. So yeah, I will just uh, end it there. I hope I've covered everything that I've said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kalifela. That was very, very profound. Um, because of time, I see that there's uh, quite a lot of hands. I'm going to ask that you keep your question straight to the point and your comments straight to the point, one minute max, and uh, so that we can have everyone say what they what they think or what they feel about this uh, topic. I'm going to unmute uh, Zintle. Hi, I believe everyone is well. Okay, uh, from, from everything that has been said, I think before we start to point on them, we would see why are they in that situation? First, we must deal with the roots because most of the guys that are gay, most of them they went through a lot when they are young. I have a friend who is gay, he used to be raped by his older brother when he was young. So now Guban Zima for Yena to express I'm a feelings work it to a uh, opposite gender to another female. I think also with this thing a judgmental like sin is sin. Like if unjonja it's a sin. If you are gay, it's a sin. Kungabina lesu, there is a sin that is bigger than another. Zonki zono ziafana pam gamtale. So kungabi uguti because he's gay, it's on a kesi sinkulu munyo. If we call it sin is sin, everyone is a sinner. Ugutu muntu yena uzo figa ganja nkulunkuru. It's a, it's a, it's in the bayer can on Kurunkul as is in any tina lapotina. We are the judge. Unkurunkula Gazang was Fagutis Banga Macha and Claben, but e personal relationship your moon to non Kurunkul, Axenda Bayet. So I have a friend who is gay, like he prays more than I do. They trust in God more than I do. E relationship here can on Kurunkul and as Wutinjan. So I think it's not our duty to question them. Which, why are they there? Why are they doing that? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Daniel? Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. That's quite a lot to digest today. Um, just straight to the point, as you said, so, um, I, I hear you spoke about the testimony regarding this topic, homosexual, and Anthony, he talked about it, that he has a, a friend, a best friend, and so on, and the friend got married and so forth. My question is, um, how, do, how do one, how do I, not, not particularly me, how do you establish a relationship with um, someone that is a homosexual or all those ladies and so forth? Because 
I, I just cannot comprehend that because being straight as I am, you know, and 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 it, it shapes the way I see the view, the cases which I see the view and so forth. And it, it, in, in a church or a, a community of, of believers, I, I believe in order for us to be functional, we, we need to identify our sexuality and be, be, be certain about that. So if one is not certain about their sexuality, how do they function even at church? How do I relate to them, you know? So it's, it's quite hard for, for me and, and other folks to establish a relationship with those people. So yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Let's keep it nice, short and sweet. I'm going to unmute uh, Makaduzela. Hi, you guys can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, first of all, I just want to appreciate the, the presenter, well articulated. You know your thing, man. Appreciate. Secondly, Anthony, please do right by one on which is dying. And I think it's uh, not good to be ducking and diving when Ndana Bandu is coming, just picking your bags. So get ready. Lastly, I just want to say uh, to all of us in this group, uh, please be careful, you know, when you, in, in your approach to, to homosexuality, because uh, just going through the comment section, it sounds as if there are so many of you who are very proud that you are not uh, gay or lesbian, but at the same time, you, and, and, and it seems to give you some sort of relief that you are not that. But understand that, uh, as the presenter has said, sin is sin, okay? Sin is sin. Uh, God does not have a softer side to him that uh, will pass on some sins and be harsh on other sins, right? So my question that I asked earlier was, as a church, what is our message? Because it is one thing to tell someone where you stand about something. It is another then to actually talk about what is um, what is what is our message to them? Because I've not heard anyone here say God loves homosexuals, right? I've not heard anyone say that. What I'm seeing in the comment section every time this question comes up is, look at Sodom and Gomorrah, and now we're like, okay, Sodom and Gomorrah. So is that our message to anyone that any time we meet um, the gay community, all we just think about is fine, brimstone coming down. And that, yeah, that's just their fate, you know, as if like the, that is not the fate of the fornicator, as if that is not the fate of the liar, as if that is not the fate of the adulterer, as if that is not the fate of the betrayer, you know. So when we deal with this situation, we must also realize that we are just sinners and God will judge sinners, not based on how much sin they have had, right? So in that, let's just be humble and understand that we are just sinners who need grace, who need God to save us from whatever situation that we may find ourselves in and that we do not fully understand also what other people are struggling with. Because I hear, I see comments here saying, but how did you do that? You made a choice when you were young and stuff like that. That is not really the issue because there is many reasons or sources of how things can end up the way they are. The question is now that I'm here, how I am supposed to move forward with God, with this situation? Because I do understand that there's things that are just very difficult for people. Like everyone is struggling with something because some of you are saying, no, this is abomination, this is that. If you are judging homosexual people for being, for, for being homosexual, I think in the same line also, you should be very, you should ask yourself, Uti, why any feba? You are not homosexual, but we are feba. Why are you feba when? You're not homosexual, but you are a liar, you're an adulterer. Where is that coming from? If you want to so much investigate the source of homosexuality, where is your own weaknesses coming from? So at the end of the day, we must say, look, I'm a sinner. I found myself in a position where I'm a sinner. One thing I know, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Now, that's the conversation we need to, 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 uh, to talk about to say if someone was homosexual and they came to us and they say, look, I am a homosexual person, but I do understand the word of God now. What am I supposed to do next? The church will not even know what to do 
right? Because you know how to judge people when they're having situations, but do not know anything. Do not know how to help them. Even in Christ, you do not know. You do not pray for people whom you know have situations. And you are judging people who also have problems, but at the same time, you cannot even pray for them. If they come out and say, okay, we invite you as the gay community, come to our compa, come to our community, pray for us, help us to get better so that we do not find ourselves as homosexuals anymore. You do not know because the, 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 the thing is, um, because, 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 because when you look at them, the only thing that you can see the only thing that you can see is them going to hell. It's only them burning in fire. If they decide that they are no longer gay today and they want to be Christians, what will you do with them? You have no idea. You don't even know how they are going to live their life afterwards. So speak less and pray more, even for yourself, because you yourself, you are a liar, you are a judge, and everything that you are, you will also go to hell, the same hell that you think that homosexuals are going and you are not going, you will go as well. So we must be very clear to, to, to say that under this whole sin thing, we are all sinners in need of a savior. And there's no one who is more sinful and more hated by God than the other. God loves the children he has created. In all the avenues of sin, God will seek his children. Even you, who's, who's not homosexual, who's not gay, but is a liar and adulterer, God is seeking you with so much love, the same way he would a homosexual person. Because if you do not repent of your sin, you are also going in the same direction. That's where you are going also. If you lie, you kill, you do all these things. Do not think that you are headed to a much uh, a hell, uh, I mean, a much colder, a hell that is not uh, hotter than the one where the homosexuals will go. You will go to the same hell, everyone, including drunkards and everything. The Bible is very clear. So when we, when we speak of this, do not say, but how did you become this? You chose it, you know. Just, just re look at yourself as a person, deal with your own life, deal with your own sins, understand that if you think God is as powerful to deal with the homosexual person, then God is as powerful to deal with your chronic sin that you've been doing for years and that will pull nucleus or so on. So please, let's just be loving and be less judgmental and pray more that God helps those people that we do not even know how to help because he knows how to deal with his own children we do not know ourselves, but he knows them. He knows us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, that was uh, very, very profound. And I see that you spoke with power and passion. Um, also, let us just remind each other that whenever we also have these conversations, it's also an opportunity for us to introspect onto how do we actually go back into the churches and treat uh, people whom we deem different from us, right? So I appreciate that, uh, that comment. I'm going to ask Toby to unmute. Uh, himself or you um uh thank you thank you thank you for giving me this opportunity um kulu fellow i just want to thank you for this presentation that you had that you made um clearly you you researched um this topic very well so um i wish you well in your endeavors however my comment is not directed to you my i don't have a question i just have a comment directed to um anyone who's gay or lesbian in this platform um is that what i just want to say to you is that um our relationship with christ is personal and private um and you should take that you should read the bible for yourself speak to god and let him tell you what is and what is not. Because if you were to go with what the church says, um, a lot of the things in our church gets decided through a vote or through people going to the conference. The eloquent orators usually win. There are women in this church who wanted, who said they had a calling to be pastors. Um, and that issue was taken to a vote. It didn't matter what the, vote, um, the word of God says, whether women should be pastors or not, the majority vote, that, that became what the word of God says. So what I want to say is that um, stop hating yourself. Stop hating yourself because you are wonderfully and fearfully made in the image of God. God loves you and you do not need anybody else's love. 
that's all that I want to say. The relationship of Christ is personal and private. You will know what is and what isn't if you go close to God. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Melissa, you're back. Um, she had gone somewhere, so she asked me to take over for a bit. If she's back, then we'll take it up. Um, Kulu, we're about to end the session anyway. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Toby, for that one. Theo was given a chance. Theo is not here anymore. There's about seven hands remaining. Um, Kulu, between us and you, can we give it an extra 10 minutes? You know, we know we asked you to stay until half past. Really, please do. I mean, man, you, this, this is a hot one, eh? Um, so let's give it another maybe 10 minutes or so. Can we try to stick to the one minute that I was given? Let me give the order in the following way. Um, Van Heden and Don Bizodwa, Art, um, Kalesia, Michelle, uh, Anthony, in fact, uh, Queen, and then Anthony will be the last one right there. All right, so in that order, Van Heden, Don, we get ready, guys, with the comments. Art, um, Kalesia, Michelle, Queen, and then Anthony. Try to give it a minute. Another 10 more minutes, we're about to finish the conversation. And thank you so much for sticking as far as you did. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, um, Kulu, for sharing your, your presentation with us. And um, I think, guys, I, I've, I've noticed, even with me, the culture has so much infiltrated us that um, some, of the, some, of, some of what Kulu was saying was making me feel uncomfortable because we are being bombarded on a daily basis and I, and it's so subtle and and the truth now seems like it's wrong and and I was squirming you know and when Kudu was talking I, I, I was almost like sweating you know like yo that sounds hectic that sounds hectic and let's be careful guys um as as Ooh, Ooh K said I don't think our mandate is to study the origins of homosexuality and the ins and the outs. I think what we are called to study is to study the love of God, to study how to love people who are sinners just like us, to study how to give hope to people, to point them where they should go, those who need help. So I think now um, the only gay ministry it, that I know is the coming out ministries, but I know it's a it's an online ministry. Do we have anything in in South Africa or any anywhere around that can assist people who want to come out um, of 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 this lifestyle? And yeah, so so my that's my comment to say, let's our our mandate will never understand the depth. We will never, we're not geneticists, we are not, we are not sin specialists. We, we cannot explain and scrutinize sin. Why do people, why are people gay? Why, why do people come at home, uh, um, what's this, adultery? Why do people, so let's study love, how to love and to point people where they can go. That's what uh, I think the next steps we should be taking, um, I think. Edmund, with your permission, can I also comment? That's okay. Okay. Uh, Kulu, when you started, you said that uh, uh, God is against the act and not really the, the people. I think we need to uh, uh, gay those who practice homosexuality and not really the people. God loves the people. So that was established when, when we started. When we are speaking uh, like this, we are not condemning uh, anyone, but uh, the act has been condemned by God himself. Mm -hmm. So we, are re, uh, we were only stating what uh, God has said. Having said that, uh, there are people who, are, who say they are not practicing homosexuals. Uh, I mean, they're gay people. They're gay, but uh, they're not uh, really practiced. And that's probably going to be a challenge that the church is going to be faced with in future, especially when it comes to nominations uh, and the like. What is your take on those who say they are not practicing?
Okay, um, thank you so much for that. I just want to interrupt uh, lest we forget our Facebook community. Uh, we know that uh, this uh, presentation is being streamed on Facebook as well. So I'm just going to also read the comments uh, from Facebook. Okay, Nonsigale um, Lontapo says, people need to understand the real reason for getting into a marital setting. At times, young people are pressured into a marriage without having a valid reason. Once we understand why we do certain things, we will live in peace. Okay, I think that was a follow up from Umta says, how does one know they're gay or lesbian, especially when you are married? Uh, when you hear a married man is gay, what would have happened? Marriage expectations not met. So uh, Nancy Gelelo was just responding to that. Um, going to read the other comment from Umta it says, uh, what happens to people within the church uh, that, that, that identify themselves of the LGBTQI community? I am afraid that some of the people will then get married just for the sake of getting married, but have the same sex affairs outside marriage. This is happening within the church. And um, how should Mpo Mohaka says, how should one handle a, an asexual person? You discover that when married, a person says he or she is not sexually attracted to his person. Uh, to his partner. Okay, I, I don't know if I have covered uh, most of the, of the comments, but just so that we include our Facebook community as well. I know Umta had uh, given an order uh, to unmute. Uh, please Umta, can you unmute accordingly? Tom is unmuted, Tom, go ahead. Thank you so much Pundis, for being here and for sharing your experience for our edification right i love how you invited us to show love to show compassion even to those of a different sexual orientation ultimately i believe i believe we all belong to a broader community the community of children of god and i think if we engage or relate to each other as such we will not struggle to love uh, members of the lgbtq plus uh, community right uh, I also think we'd also be equally pained when we hear stories of corrective rape, when we hear of stories of all forms of abuse against the LGBTQI community, because before their sexual orientation, we relate, relate to them as children of God. And it really bothers me that some of these ill evils and social ills are committed in the name of God and in the name of the Bible. And it makes me wonder um, what kind of God would want you to rape someone as a way of converting them to him. And now the point that I really, really want to place on record is that I genuinely believe that the members of the LGBTQI plus community are holding all of us hostage. I have sometimes um, taken the level of being a conformist uh, for my stance or what I just shared or how I relate to members of the, L the LGBTQI community, right? But I genuinely believe we are being held hostage. You cannot disagree with members of, of this community and, and live to tell the story. You, you risk uh, losing your, your career or, or anything or being criticized public or social media for just sharing a, a, a different view. I recall of a gentleman who shared on, online that he was very uncomfortable with other guys approaching him from the back. Actually, he said his friend approaching him from, uh, from the back, back. He ended up training for a guy for, for being a homophobe. And, and I was thinking, now I can't express my a feeling or how I want to help people to relate to me or to engage with me for fear of being a homophobe for, because when you talk about being approached from the back, someone thinks of gay sex and so forth. And I also understand people who choose to distance themselves from the LGBT community because sometimes Mfundisi, you engage with lesbian and you get questions like, have you ever dated a girl? Then you say, oh no, I, I, I identify as straight. They're like, that's only because you've never given yourself um, or opened the possibility of dating a girl. So I understand why other people feel like this is an agenda we are being recruited to, to also try it out. 
I agree with you, we must love. And I, I don't have a problem of existing within people of different sexual orientation. But if my, in existing in that platform, every now and then I must be told that um, the reason why I'm attracted to men is because I've not opened the possibility of dating fellow girls. I, I have a problem with that as well. So I, I also believe that this bullying is both sides. We get bullied a lot, even though some of us sometimes come out against our better judgment and defend the LGBTQI community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are going to have U Michelle, Anthony, Queen, and Kalesia. Um, Ty is going to um, unmute. We are not taking any more hands. After that, uh, Kulufelo, you will just uh, shed light on the questions uh, mentioned in the comments and also give us your concluding remarks. So please, guys, let's keep it short so that we can uh, we, we avoid taking too much of the speaker's time. There is after scenes where everyone will get the chance to talk as much as they possibly want to. So we have Michelle, uh, Anthony, and Quinn. Um, Ta, please unmute. Hi, um, yeah, I'm on Lucy. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to ask two questions based on what um, the pastor was saying. Is anal sex acceptable in marriage? And what age do you think is appropriate to operate on an intersex? And that's it. That's all I wanted those questions answered because I it wasn't clear. Thanks so much. Next one. I've unmuted Michelle. Uh, hi, everybody. I think uh, from what we are picking up here, there's obviously a lot of fear from, from us Black people because um, like so one person mentioned that historically um, in the Black community, we didn't openly speak about uh, homosexuality and all the other alphabets. My question is, is the church being reactive? Because from what I hear, that at some Pathfinder camps and adventurer camps, kids are already starting to experiment with each other. And if we are not teaching openly about it, then somebody is teaching. I mean, governments are getting ready to teach the kids in school. So at what point are we as families discussing this? At what point are we as, as, as a church saying, okay, maybe we need it as a, one of our Sabbath school lessons and not in in an attacking and um, just plainly attacking and saying Sodom and Gomorrah, but at what point are we gonna start having proper conversations like the one which we have had now in, in a church set up where even Abu Gogo will listen to, to the conversations and, 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 and help build us from there. So I just think that we could be reactive as a church um, and thank you for the platform leaders for, for organizing this because it's necessary, it's important. Adventurers and pathfinders are, 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 are experimenting and we figure out these things when it's too late. Okay. Thank you. We will have Anthony. Um, okay, there's Anthony and Art. Can I please try to give Art first because Anthony spoke, then he'll be the last one to, to, to speak. All right, so let's have Art. Uh, and then um, Anthony will come and be the last one. Uh, thank you very much. I think mine is a question. I want to just, before I ask, appreciate uh, the presenter. Thank you so much for a very informative session. Um, I just wanted to ask in terms of the intersex um, um, anomaly, uh, what is the extent um, of that? Uh, you know, when, when we get cases of intersex, um, is, the, is it possible for a child to basically have all the equipment of a woman um, and then also, uh, you know, uh, the equipment of a male um, all at the same time? Or is, is there... Is there one that dominates most of the time and then the others are not functional or you get cases where all are functional at the same time? Uh, what, what, what is the extent? And then I think you touched on it a bit in terms of how one decides then whether this one is a male or a female. Uh, but can you maybe just run through that again for me, please? Thank you. All right, we're good with Anthony now. Thank you, Art. 
Uh, Melissa, I think those are the last hands and um, then we can give over to Kulu to wrap it up for us. Hi guys, can you hear me fine? Not yes. clear with the accent from UK. <laughs> so, so, so someone asked a question. There was someone who came on and asked a question and said, how I've got a best friend who's gay. How can I spend time with someone who's gay? How can I relate to someone who's gay? So it, this, this, this kind of thinking takes me back to when people were asking Jesus, how can Jesus hang out with prostitutes and tax collectors? They are still people. We're not saying that we're agreeing with what they're doing. I, I had already said that I made it perfectly clear that I call sin by its name. I have said to my friend on countless times, I do not agree with your lifestyle. It's not, it's not God's will for that to happen. He knows full well. When he got married, I was not invited to the wedding because he knew I did not approve of the wedding or his lifestyle. It doesn't mean that we, we cut people off because of their lifestyle choices. And being gay is a lifestyle choice, the same way as being a player is a lifestyle choice. Being an adulterer is a lifestyle choice. Being a wife beater is an, a, a lifestyle choice. Being a liar isn't a lifestyle choice. So we, we, we can be very clear to call them out on that sort of behavior. When, when my friend came out as gay to me, it was a shock. It was a huge shock because I had never known any gay people. I didn't have any gay friends. That was, and this is someone I grew up with. So when he came out, it's one of the things that I said clearly. Now I had a choice that when he came out, I had a choice of either cutting him off, which a lot of people may have done. They said, look, man, I don't agree with your lifestyle and we can't be friends anymore. Or you take Jesus's approach. The woman that was caught in adultery, Jesus, what did Jesus say to her? He says, is there, he says, go and sin no more. He didn't cut her off. He was saying, look, I don't agree. You know, I, I think some people, um, someone was using the word um, or whatever, right? So God was saying, I don't agree with you being a fevi, right? He made that very clear. He said, go and sin no more. But he didn't cut the person off. And I think that's the thing we have to remember is that we need to have still that loving attitude where, yes, I don't agree with your lifestyle. The same thing with when, when you look at Umduana, you know, a child, when you look at a child, if a child does something naughty, do you cut the child off? Or you just, do you say to that child, a young child, no, you're not supposed to do that. It doesn't mean you stop loving that child. It does not mean that you stop caring about that child because of their sin. You, God hates the sin, not the sinner. And we always need to remember that. God hates the sin. It's the sin that is going to keep us from heaven. It's not the being a sinner. Being a sinner is not going to keep us from heaven. Sinning is going to keep us from heaven. So if we remember that in all our relationships and all our dealings and are sensitive to that fact, then we cannot go wrong. Thank you so much. Over to you, Kulufelo. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, your comments. Good comments, informative. Thank you so much. And the question as well, they are helping us to learn together as you're asking questions. Thank you so much. Laura, just quickly, just going through as we are concluding. Um, the first speaker uh, mentioned that um, most of the homosexual people and even for the other alphabets involved, they've gone th through much trauma, like much trauma, much pain, and then we should sympathize with that. And yeah, that is given, we should do that as a church. We should be at that place where we are able to sympathize as Jesus, as a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, with our pain, with our traumas, with our tragedies, and be able to communicate the love of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of God, and most importantly, the healing of God in those areas. All right, and after having said that, we must speak the truth. Because the problem here is that when a person comes with a history of I've been raped repeatedly at the young age, you might be tempted to be sympathetic and not speak the truth and say, if I say, okay, I hear you, my brother, that you have been raped. I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm so sorry about that. And I sympathize with you. And then I'm here with you. I will walk with you. I will walk with you through this healing process. But at the same time, the life that you, you have kept for yourself of homosexuality due to that pain that you have gone through 
in the earlier years, in the earlier formative years, it's not the right way, it's not the biblical way. So some believers have a problem with bringing that truth because they think that the, the person who is paining or who's having pain will say, a pe- will, will say the believer is not understanding their pain or is not sympathizing with their pain. But the truth is you can sympathize with the pain and the trauma and say the truth at the same time. And victory and healing and deliverance comes when you balance the two. You sympathize, you walk with, through healing process with the person, love walk with the person, but tell them the truth. Say the Lord discourages this, the Lord doesn't approve this. Please, can you try to repent as we are healing together? All right. If they reject you as being judgmental, as being unsympathetic, it's okay. Then they will find another person who will only sympathize. But don't sacrifice truth with sympathy. They must go together. If a person doesn't want the other, then you, 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 there's nothing much that you can do with that person. It means they're not ready to change. So you can just be there for them as a friend. You can be for them as a family in that regard. But it's a matter of helping them through a process. Then you just step back. But be for them as a friend, as a as a colleague. Just love them. All right. Okay. We're moving from that one, and then the other speaker. He asked, uh, how do we establish a relationship with a homosexual person? Then he said that it's very, very difficult for him or for other brethren to establish a relationship, a working relationship with homosexual in the church. All right. Then he said, because he's 100% heterosexual, he's attracted to women. So how do you relate with these people? How do you talk to them? How do you befriend them? How do you spend time with them? How do you invite them to your house as in living with them every day? Okay. The answer is simple. You relate with homosexuals and any other person who's who's struggling with any sexual struggle. You relate with them the same way you relate with a liar. You relate with them the same way you relate with a gossiper, with a thief, with a person with jealousy. Because all those things are sins, but then you are able to relate with those people. You are able to, okay, tell them the truth about their sin of lying, their sin of gossip, their sin of fornication. But then at the same time, you are able to love them and invite them to your house. It's still the same thing here. You love them, but then you love them, all right? After loving them, you tell them the truth. And after telling them the truth, whether they accept it or not, you become their friend or you become their brother and then walk with them the same way you're working with a person who's lying who's committing adultery, because all that thing, it's sin. It falls under one category of sin. There's no bigger sin and a a smaller sin, all right? But just to bring balance on what I've said, because somebody might say, yes, I hear you culturally saying homosexuality and other alphabets, they are sin, but then you cannot really relate it or put on the same measure with lying. We put on the same measure as a, in, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a form of their action, their action is a sin. But then in terms of homosexuality, the person feels something from within them, but a liar doesn't feel lies from within. Because when you're lying, you don't feel anything in your body, you don't feel anything in your emotions, you don't feel anything in your sexuality, you don't feel anything in your psyche. But as a homosexual, that thing is internal. You feel it from within. Okay, and then the a liar doesn't feel it from within. It's a mental thing. It's a mental thing that he does. All right, so they are all seen in terms of actions. But then this one, we give it a different attention because we have to deal with the person from internally, deal with how they feel emotionally, um, how they feel um, in their mind, in their sexuality, in their anatomy, in their physiology. Deal with those areas as a matter of when you are dealing with them in in a process of of, of healing and restoration. But in terms of labeling them, they are all sins, but then this one will give special attention in terms of digging deeper into the inner members of a person because so emotions, mind, body, everything is involved. And it feels like this person is feeling everything all over. And it, it, that feeling or that state, it makes them to feel like my sin is special because I feel my sin is from within than like, you know, it's not special. You're just feeling it from within but then it's the same. So we'll expand on that on another day on how to really help a person on that regard because we don't have time on this platform. So another another speaker mentioned, okay, it was a comment actually from another speaker was saying that many of you on this platform, you feel relieved because you say, I'm not a homosexual, I'm not a lesbian. You feel relieved. It's something that you feel relieved. And I like the way he said, he said, 
um, you are relieved, but then you find yourself that you are still lying, you are still cheating, you are still you are still suffering from jealousy, you are envious. All those things are seen. God will judge them, and if you don't repent, you'll go to hell. So you must not be relieved if you have any other sin that you're struggling with. You're struggling with jealousy, lying is still a sin. There's no chance of being relieved. And to adding on that, you must be sympathetic in a way that most people, an operative way being most people, most people who are homosexual, they didn't choose that. They didn't wake up one day, say, hi, today I feel like homosexual. I'm going to sleep with another guy. No, they didn't choose that. Many of them. So I want the church of God to really understand that, the church of God to really take that to heart, to know that many homosexual and many people in that alphabet, they really didn't choose that life. When they came of age, when they came into their sexuality at a young age, they found themselves uh, being attracted to the same sex. They, they have done nothing. They didn't choose it, most of them. Only few people choose it. They just turn from heterosexuality and then choose it. They are few. But then many of them that you see all around, many of them in our church, many of them outside the church, they didn't choose it. So be sympathetic. And let me dare say, you could be, you could have been one of them. <laughs> you could have been one of them because it's not a choice. It's something that happened to them because of other causes which we won't go into. As we said that there are many causes, but then we'll emphasize a way out and a way out is Jesus. So be humble whenever you see a homosexual person, a lesbian person, a transgender person, be humble, be loving, be accepting because it could have been you. There's nothing that makes you special. You didn't choose to be heterosexual. You didn't. Not in this world. You can't choose it because something happened to them that they didn't have control over and then they find themselves there and they will do anything to get out of that state. So we as a church, we should be able to help them and to love them out and to support them and to give them pastoral counseling until they're in a place where they're able to live a holy life and then not um, living a sinful life of their sexuality. All right. Then the other speaker, um, all right, it's very good. It's just emphasizing that um, as a church, we must be big on lifting off a cloud of condemnation, a cloud of guilt that is on top of people who are struggling with these issues. Many, they come into our church, they have condemned themselves, the world has condemned themselves, and when they come to church, they don't need us to add more condemnation. We should lift up the condemnation by loving them and then accepting them, but at the same time, tell the truth. It's very important because many believers, they love them, they accept them, they give them grace, but they don't tell them the truth. You haven't done the work. The work is not finished. You love, you accept, you tell, you, 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 you give grace, and then you tell the truth. Then the job is finished. Then um, or the, another speaker wanted, was talked about um, the, the homosexual act. Uh, that homosexual act, is it a, a, a sin? A homosexual act is a sin, and then homosexual person, a uh, Okay, he said that uh, we must differentiate between the act itself and the person himself, all right, in that, in that order. Yes, it is very, very important for us as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that when a person comes into our midst, we'll be able to separate them from the sin that they are doing, which is an act, and from them as a person. An act is when they go out and sleep with other men and sleep with other women. That's a homosexual act. And then that we should condemn and that's we should say no you should not supposed to do that but at the same time love the person love that brother because they are not their sin they are not homosexual sin they are a person they are your brother they are your sister love them as they are dispense the love of god to them shower them with love eat with them invite them for dinners and all that but then always speak into their homosexual sin and condemn it but they don't condemn the person it is quite it, it's it's not a gray area it's not a gray area, it's possible to do it. I don't want to call it a gray area, it's possible to do it. Even though some other people, when you condemn the sin and accept them, they'll say, no, you're condemning me. Because it seems like that sin is part of them. When you say, no, do not do this, they seem like you are addressing them. So others will understand you, others won't understand you, but continue doing the right thing, saying sin is sin, as in the homosexual act itself. And then the homosexual person themselves, they are not their sin. They are accepted by Lord, we accept them at the church and the Lord accept them and we should love them, all right? And then lastly, I was seeing on the comments of the people there, they were asking if a person who's struggling with homosexuality can go to heaven. That's a very big question, isn't it? A person who's struggling with homosexuality, yes, they can go to heaven on this condition. They can go to heaven if they don't practice homosexuality. 
practicing homosexuality, it is um, when they sleep with other people committing a sin. But if they don't commit sin, they just have this feeling that they are struggling with, but they don't actualize the feeling by sleeping with another person, having emotional relationship and physical relationship. They don't have those two relationships, emotional and physical. They don't have it. Then that person will go to heaven. You will meet that homosexual person in heaven because they didn't live, they didn't live in their homosexual lifestyle. And when who's not a homosexual, you can go to hell because you lived in your sin, pointing at that one who is having feminine gestures. When they preach, they look feminine or they look masculine, and then you point your finger at them, not knowing that yes, they look masculine or they look feminine as a man, but then they are living a holy life. And then they'll go to hell, they'll go to heaven, I'm sorry. They'll go to heaven while when you're going to hell. So Rest assured, if there's any person in this platform struggling with homosexuality, you'll go to heaven if only you live a holy life. Stick to living a holy life. Say no to homosexual act and sinning, you'll go to heaven. All right. And then lastly, uh, even at the church, in church setting, you can use such a person to be a chorus leader, to preach the word, to do, to, to come and do holy communion. The person who's struggling with homosexuality, you can use those people because they are not seen. As long as they are not practicing homosexuality, as long as they are not, as long as they are not sleeping around, you can use them. All right, you can use them because that feeling in itself, it's not making them to sin. A sin comes when you act, just like with anger. The Lord says, be angry, but don't allow your anger to cause you to sin. You know, that is in the way. The Lord allows you to be angry. And anger is a feeling that you feel. But then he says, don't allow that feeling to make you to sin. So when you are angry, you don't go to hell for being angry. You go to hell for swearing. You go to hell for damaging property. For damaging property, you get it. So the person for them for having, for having a feeling of homosexuality, they won't go to hell for, for having a feeling. So they'll go to hell or God condemns them. They time they start acting on it but if they don't act on it they are okay the same one who's angry but then they don't cause harm they don't swear at the person then they are fine is the same uh is the same thing so I, I hope we understand each other because i'm a bit in a in a hurry just getting through this point and then the other person mentioned a very important point about um marriage uh they said that some other people who are struggling with homosexuality in the church, in the church, they'll get married because of pressure, because of wanting to be included, that we discourage greatly. If you are in this platform and then you are struggling with homosexuality, you are struggling with a lesbian, you are struggling with any other sexual struggle, please don't rush into marriage as a cover. Don't go and hide in marriage. Don't do that. We discourage that. Marriage will not heal you of, of your homosexuality. I'll say that again, marriage does not heal homosexuality. So you must not get married. You must go for counseling. You must go for help. You must go through healing first and make sure you are totally healed, you are totally uh, are processed out. And then you will even know it in your heart and in your spirit, even in your emotions, even in your body, even in your physiology, that now I am in a better place to be able to be in marriage. But do not ever hide in marriage because you will be making a great injustice to the other person you are married to. So we must not do that, all right? Okay, and then they said that, um, they said another, uh, they said the effect that if you find that your spouse is homosexual, they tell you when you are getting married, you find that they are homosexual inside marriage, what do you do to it? Do you divorce? Because they didn't tell you. I don't think, personally, I don't think you should divorce, you should, both of you should go for counseling. If they are, they are willing to walk this walk of purity and they're willing that God has helped them out, God can help them out while they are support system. You can stay with them and God can help them, all right? But then if you want to get, then it is your choice. No one can condemn you for that. You, you can do that. You have a right to do that. But then if you want to stay, God can still help you. The, the condition being that your spouse must be willing to change. Your spouse must love God so much that they want to change, all right? But then if you see that they, they, are, not, they, are, not, they are not serious about changing, they say, I'm sorry, and then they go, next time they do adultery, they keep on falling and getting up, then you can decide of getting out. But if you see that this man or this woman is serious about living this lifestyle, support them and God will help you out. But then you will decide what you do in that marriage. If you are getting out or you are staying with them and then both of you are going for counseling and there's help, there is help if you want to go together or continue with that spouse, all right? And um, yes, um, 
then the other speaker spoke about bullying. Uh, we, we spoke a lot about bullying. I'm not going to go into that, but then I'm just going to touch what she said. She said that um, um, when, I, because I mentioned earlier on that I have friends who are homosexual and these friends are not saved. They don't know the Lord. They are from the world. They don't subscribe to my biblical standards, but then they are my friends. We understand each other. We eat together. We, 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 we always together, all right? And then there's no tension. But then she said that, when she's with some of the lesbian women, they ask her if she has had sex with another woman. So, and then she said it is hard for her to befriend or to be close to people who are struggling. All right. Um, if you happen to be in such uh, relationships or such companionships or such gathering, you must put boundaries. You must put strict, strict boundaries and say, Okay, we'll not talk about sex. I don't want to know how you do your sex, what, how you do it, where you do it, and all the nitty gritties of your sex life as a homosexual. I don't want to know about it. We are not discussing that. That is not on the table. We'll discuss any other thing, not about our sex life. And don't ask me about whether I've slept with another woman or with another man. Let's not talk about our sex life. I will not do that. Put those boundaries. And then if you're putting those boundaries, then you're able to talk about other things, about politics, about sports, about things happening in the social media. There are many things to talk about and avoid those, uh, uh, there is those areas that will make you to be uncomfortable, all right? You can only talk about them if they need counseling. But then if they're going into, poking into you, have you slept with another woman? Is because you don't know that you are a lesbian just because you haven't tried it. Try to test yourself to see if you are really a heterosexual. Then they put your foot down and say, no, you're not going to talk to me like that. You are not allowed. Please stop it. And if they don't stop it, then you walk away. You break that relationship. Don't force yourself into that relationship. If they don't respect your boundaries, walk away. My friends that I have, they respect my boundaries. They don't talk weird things when they're with me because they know what I stand for. Okay, that must be clear. And then... The other speaker asked about anal sex. Okay, I've spoken about anal sex, but I've been general because it's coming for the second time this anal sex. I'll be just direct, I'll dial direct, all right? They're asking if anal sex is acceptable, all right? I would say uh, from, it, it, okay, I would start by saying from Genesis to Revelation in the Bible, the word flow does not mention anything about anal sex, all right? So issues that are kind of gray areas, issues that are not mentioned in the Bible, we use what we call the general impression of the Bible, what the Bible implies generally. When we look at the Bible generally, and here I'm speaking about the people who love God, people who want to pursue holiness, not people who want to use the Bible to benefit their own desires, who want to use the, the Bible to kind of justify what they want to do. But I'm speaking to the people who love God, who want to please God. And if you want to please God, you will take what I'm saying. According to the general impression of the Bible, in a married, in a married situation where husband and wife, anal sex is not advised. It's not advised at all. The reason being, the reason being that um, sex originally was created for procreation. So the, the in, in anal sex, there's no procreation there. There's no procreation at all. And then again, the second reason is that the enemy, Satan, has introduced anal sex into homosexual relationships. And then he introduced that in homosexual relationship. Why did he introduce anal sex in, homosexual, in a homosexual relationship, Satan? He introduced it so that he can uh, kind of reverse the order of God. Because God said you'll, you'll procreate from the front using your, your, your front private parts, not your anus, using your front private parts, is how God have said it. Then Satan comes and then change it and said, okay, I want to do the opposite of what God said. Because God said the front genitals, now I'm going to say the back, um, I'm going to say the back, the back things, which is the anus. And then in that way, Satan, again, he is kind of uh, po uh, po uh, po poking God in his eyes by doing that. And another person have said that, again, the enemy is bringing an insult to God when a male seed, the, the precious male seed, because our my seed is precious, a seed of every man in this platform is very precious. When that seed is then combined, combined with feces, with feces, because it's going to the anus. I'm sorry for being graphic, but I want to expound this as much as I can. Okay. Uh, says Satan wanted to 
that every time homosexuals have sex, this seed is mixed with feces, then it's contaminated because once it mixed with feces, it's contaminated because it's on the contaminated area. The anus is contaminated. It's going to the contaminated area. So it's like, again, insulting God. Even though it's giving pleasure to them, it's a pleasurable thing, but then it's, inside, it's insulting God. That's what Satan wanted to do. That every time they do that act of homosexual, it's an insult to God. It's an insult to God. It's an insult to God. But we know that when a husband and a wife have sex, with their pri front private parts, not anal sex. Whenever they have sex, that brings glory to God. Do you know that, believers? When I have sex with my wife, every time I have sex with my wife, that brings glory to God. Every time I engage with my wife, the heaven rejoices, angels rejoices. Like there's a, there's a ululation in heaven because this is what God wanted. Whether we are having sex in terms of we want to procreate, we want to have a baby, or we are having sex in terms of giving each other pleasure and enjoying each other, it doesn't matter. But every time we come together, heaven rejoices, it glorifies God. And then when homosexual people come together because it's a seed going on the contaminated area, which is the anus, then God is not glorified, it's an insult to God. And I can be crucified for saying the things I am saying, but then we will say them anyway, because we don't want to hold the truth. We don't want to revise the truth. We don't want to minimize the truth. We don't want the truth to be prohibited. We don't want to be bullied out of the truth. We are not insulting anybody here. We are saying our opinions out there. So the sister who asked about the anal sex, no, if you love God, you and your husband, it is unacceptable, do not do it. Then the last thing, the last thing about this anal sex, oh my God, it's very dangerous for males, okay? If there's any male in here who's married, who's thinking of doing anal sex? Who, if there's any male in here who's, who's thinking of doing anal sex or who's doing anal sex, you know, there's a trap there. There's a very dangerous, poisonous trap that, all right, you will go anal with your wife, 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 okay, for some time. Then, because... The anus of a man and anus of a woman, they look the same. Anatomically, they look the same. I told you that I'm, I'm the medical doctor, all right? So this is my, 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 <clears throat> my realm, my realm, hence I'm speaking so freely. So the anatomy, the anus of a man and the anus of the woman, they look the same. They look the same and they feel the same, all right? So a trap is when you... Uh, customize yourself of going behind your wife every now and then. Then the enemy somewhere when your wife is not there, the time when your wife is not there, you are in a trip somewhere to Dubai with your friends. And then you feel lonely, you're missing your wife. And then your friend is there. Then the enemy can say, Papa, the anus is anus. You have been doing this thing, anus with your wife. So the anus of the brother, they are the same. Then you find yourself in that trap. And many men have found themselves being bisexual, turning bisexual in the middle of a marriage because of this factor. It's very, very dangerous. And so if you are a wife, say no to your husband. Why no? You are protecting him, not over some years for him to turn and then and be a bisexual because anus, they are anus and the enemy and say they are, they are the same. So experiment and then you have lost your husband. So it's a no. And then they ask about the age of consent, uh, about the intersex. The, the age of consent of doing um, such primary surgical reconstruction for a child. Um, I'm not really sure about that, but then I, I believe it should be around uh, 12 years and above. Yeah, it should be around 12 years and above the age of consent. Uh, that we'll just have to check and Google, but then I believe it's around uh, 12 years and above the age of consent. Below that, the child, they're not psychologically developed enough to decide what they want. And then the hormones haven't kicked in. And then even their sexual awareness have not kicked in because we start to be awakened into our sexuality around the ages of eight, nine, 10, 12. By 12, you really know that you are attracted to men or women. Around that time, 12, 13, you really, you really know because most of the people who are homosexual, they really knew when they were 10, when they were 11, because they were becoming aware of their sexuality. So it will be the same principle if it intersects, because you want the person to start feeling first. And then after feeling, but then it's not only rely, uh, uh, relied on feeling, it's relied again on the, on, on, on the chromosomal studies. Okay, If on their chromosomal studies, they indicate that they are more of a male, then it should be assigned the, the sex change should be more of a male, all right? 
should be like that. So, but then again, I'm talking about the world, not the church. Then a child who's not born again or a child who's from a Christian family that are not of God, they'll say, okay, because the chromosomal, the chromosomal studies, they are saying this child is more of a male, but then the child will say, I'm feeling more of a female, so make me a female. So you see, now you are reversing the order of God with the excuse of intersex. There you are wrong. And it's where the LGBTQI community comes in. They have sucked in the intersex people and they are not supposed to suck them in because intersex, intersex people, they don't have a sexual orientation problem. They don't have a psychological problem with their sexuality. It's just anatomical. But then the LGBTQI community have sucked them in so that they confuse them. They say, okay, no, you can choose anything. Even though when the chromosomes say you are a male, then they are saying, no, I feel like a female. Now, then they are not, they are saying, okay, the chromosomes say you are a male. Then, but now they say, no, I'm choosing to be a female. Then now they are again choosing against the order of God, then subscribing into LGBTQI community. So even the age of consent, shouldn't be much of an issue to us as believers because we do the studies and then the study says you are a man or you are a woman, then we correct you towards a male and man, a male part, even if you are still a young child. But because of legal issues in our day, we mustn't do it just to protect yourself, even though you are, you, you are, you are a church mother or church parent and you mustn't do it just to protect yourself because a, your child can turn against you when they are grown and say, why did you change me without my permission? Because you are not sure if your child will follow in your footsteps of loving God, only on that. But if we were sure that our children will love God and follow God's way, we'll just change them in that age, but then legally just follow those procedures and pray that your child won't choose against what their chromosomes are saying. It's what you must be praying for, all right? And then yes, um, then I'm concluding uh, by uh, this one is still for intersex. Uh, the, the speaker asked about the anomaly, intersex anomaly. Um, he asked about the anomaly, to, uh, to what extent is this anomaly? Uh, whether you'll find that a, a child is having um, two opposite uh, uh, genitals, like two, the male genital and the female genital all together there, or you'll find just a, a stamp, the, a, a, just a stamp of um, a penis and the full developed vagina, or you'll find the full developed penis and just um, the, 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 the stamp of uh, a vagina. He asked about that. So the question, the, the answer is, it varies from individual to individual. It varies. So the, okay, we cannot give you a definite answer and say is to this extent. Each child have their own problems. Others find that they have internal organs. Is a boy who's having ovaries, but then outside they are, they are okay. They have a boy thing, but then they have ovaries. And then they have to do chromosomal studies to determine if ever they are a boy or a girl because they have ovaries. Then the chromosomal studies, they will tell you if they are more of a boy or more of a girl. All right, that is what um what you do. And then it must be emphasized that the intersex is not a sexual orientation issue, is an anatomical issue, is an is an anatomical issue, it's not a sexual issue. We must not sexualize it. So we don't sexualize it so we can correct it with surgical correction and then pastoral counseling, and then the person becomes fine. And then I will just conclude because I said I must conclude. I would like just to conclude uh, by saying thank you so much to everyone who tuned in. It was a long discussion, long presentation. Thank you so much for tuning in, for staying in. Thank you, my host. Thank you so much. You were very good, very, very good, very informative, very insightful. And thank you, Vinny, for calling for order in the group because I saw that some people, yeah, they were quite out of order in this place. And I often ask myself, are these church people or we are joined by people who are not of church? But if people are not, church people on this platform, it's okay for them to speak the way they speak. I was just shocked, but the Lord will help us. The Lord will help us. So I wanna conclude by saying that um, as, the ch as the church of God, let's love the people of God. God will bring all kinds of people into our church. God will bring homosexuals, will bring lesbians, will bring transgender, will bring intersex into our church. He will bring them into your home set. He will bring them into your home for you to love them for you to walk with them, for you to, to, to give them healing, for you to refresh them, love them. Go all out for them, go to the ends of the earth for them, like draw them in, all right? And while you're doing that, 
but, a very big but, tell them the truth. Tell them the truth about their state, what God is saying, that God says this act is sin. Uh, this act is not supposed to be done, but then assure them that them as an individual, they are not a sin. His sin of homosexuality, of sleeping around with other men, it's a sin, it's separate, but he's not that sin. He's a person, he's loved by God, and you love this person, all right? Assure them that God loves them, but tell them the truth. Please don't compromise on the truth over love or over sympathize and give them a leeway. Don't give them a leeway by over sympathizing. Love them, but tell them the truth. And if that person is fair enough, if that person is sane enough, they will see that I, my cool fellow, loves me so much. He's cooking for me, inviting me for dinner, coming to my house, supporting me, giving money, giving me provision, but he's just against my lifestyle. Then I can work with this man if that person is fair. But if they are not fair, they'll just accuse you for being homophobic. Then if they accuse you, then step away. But please do not compromise the truth. As we said in the beginning, do not avoid the truth. Speak the truth. Do not minimize the truth. Say the whole truth. Do not revise the truth to accommodate anyone. Don't minimize it. Don't avoid it. Don't revise the truth, all right? So that the truth must not be prohibited. And then lastly, as I'm leaving, is that um, uh, my, wife has, my wife has composed a song called My Exit Door. Yeah, My Exit Door. Yes, My Exit Door. I'm excited about the song. Yeah, this song about my exit door uh, that my wife uh, composed, it, it's about um, that you, in, in, in any kind of sin, but now we are talking about homosexuality, lesbianism, and all these alphabets. We'll just zoom into this, but then it, it is for any other sin, jealousy, murder, fornication, lying, gossip, but just because of the topic of today, this song is says, Jesus, my exit door. In this song, we are saying that you might have, you might have entered into homosexuality with a different door than Tom, than Mary, than Peter. Everyone, they use different doors to come into the homosexuality. Or in other ways, they, were, they had different causes. There were different causative agents that caused them to be lesbians, homosexual, and transgender. There are many causes. Many of them, we won't exhaust them. And we don't want to exhaust them. We don't even want to go there because they won't help us. I can know how you got in, how you were abused, how you were neglected. I can know all those things, but that will not help me. It's just for me to sympathize. They are not for help, they are for sympathy. So it doesn't matter how you got in, but then there's only one way. One way is Jesus. Jesus, my exit door. You will exit through Jesus. Jesus, my exit door. It doesn't matter. So you cannot lift up your call, you, you, the way you have gone in and say, I've gotten into homosexuality through a traumatic rape because you have been raped multiple times. Now we must kind of revise Jesus' exit. We must revise Jesus' way out. No, we're not going to revise it. We're going to give you Jesus raw as he is. He is worthy and he is, he is fit to take you out. So as you go home, know that Jesus is your exit door. It doesn't matter how traumatized you were, what cause it was that caused you to be a lesbian, a gay, intersex, um, all the alphabet. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. And sometimes you don't even want to know where you started. What we want, how you entered. What we want to know is that Jesus is your exit door. And you will get out through Jesus no matter how you came in. That is a strong message I want to send you home about. So don't feel, don't, don't, don't make a pity party about how you got in. Because when I cancel most people in this area, they make a pity party about how they got in, how they were neglected by their father, absent father, abuse and all that. Then they, they bask on that and, and, and feel pity for themselves and want you as a counselor to, pity with them. No, yes, I will sympathize. I will sympathize with you. I feel sorry, but I'll say, now we are done with the pity party. We are done with sympathy. Let's move. The exit door is this side is Jesus, and you will be able to get out. All right. Thank you so much for uh, uh, being with me and bearing with me. Sometime I came strong. It's not me who's coming strong. It's the word of the Lord that was coming strong, because this word is the same way that I, I apply to myself. I'm not telling you the way that I didn't apply to myself. The same way I'm talking, strong as it is, heavy as it is, this word, harsh as it is, I apply it to myself as well. So I'm not only saying the things to you that are not applicable to myself because I had to come out of this myself through the Jesus exit, that Jesus is my exit door. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, back to the host. 
Um, Kalufela, thank you. Thank you so much. I cannot stress how amazing you have been throughout this entire session. Thank you for your patience with us. You know, uh, we have an audience of young people who are full of questions and we're very opinionated and you were very patient with us for that. Um, I see you have a book with you. You can, yes. Oh, thank you so much for that. I almost forgot because of time. Yes, I've got a book that I've written is called This Sin, This Sin. And this book, it's about any person who's struggling from any sin, could be jealousy, hatred, um, sexual struggles, just anything, any kind of sin that you're struggling with is your way out. So if you need a copy, please just uh, inbox me on Facebook. My name is they are seen there on, um, on Zoom meeting. So you can text me for the book. Uh, it's a very big book. It's 460 pages, but then it will help you a lot if you get the book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, once again, Kulufelo, thank you for your patience. I know we went over time. Uh, thank you for staying with us and being willing to answer the questions. Uh, calm and you were very composed in your answers. Thank you for also directing every single question that was said on this platform. Uh, is This group is a very diverse group. Some people have different opinions. We may share the same opinions, but one thing for sure that I've seen in this presentation that you lifted up Christ. And this this is the most important thing, whether we may agree or disagree in the approach in which we handle uh, this community, whether we may feel like we don't need to learn about them or we don't need to focus our energies on them. But one thing that you that stood out for me in this presentation is Christ being the exit door in any scene of a sort. And thank you so much for bringing this light and giving us the confidence that we can always go back to the Bible. We can always go back to God in any of our struggles. And today, there is no one who was more fit to address this topic because you yourself came out of this. You yourself were uh, once in this whole uh, dilemma and you found yourself out and therefore you can boldly testify of the grace of God and the ability to actually take yourself out of it. So I, 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 I you have inspired me so much. And I, I know that a lot of people have been inspired as well through your story and through how assertive and brave you are. It's not an easy way or an easy thing to talk about these sensitive issues nationally, in church, in schools. It's not easy. And thank you for giving us that confidence and thank you for lifting up Christ today. And I pray that above everything we may remember that all glory goes back to Christ and we may continue to soldier on in accommodating different people who are different from us and we may continue to win more souls to Christ and also address even the sins that we struggle with ourselves. Thank you once again Kulufela and thank you to the audience for the many questions that you have done. You have you have posted on the on the on the chat group you have you know you've made even jokes so you guys had your own fun on the chat you know it's such a family it's so warm thank you for your comments thank you for being you know willing to speak out and say what you think what you want to ask the speaker this program doesn't make sense without the questions from the audience this is done for us this is the speaker comes here to share and he can only share from questions and he gains insight as well and he also learns more how to refine his his presentation so your questions do not go uh, unnoticed and they are not you know not appreciated so thank you so much again to the 230 conversations audience you know that there is going to be an after scenes i'm just going to quickly uh, take you through the announcements uh, as to what's happening next week so our up uh, coming program for this uh, week is on the 30th of April. We have religion and spiritualism from Sandy Leti Siaya. Same time, same place. And then the following week, we have entrepreneurship, a practical guide. Okay, so we're going to uh, um, give you the other updates as to what we are going to cover on the upcoming weeks. Remember the disclaimer that has been placed on the screen. I'm just going to read it again the one more time for those that were not there at the beginning. Please know the views expressed during 2.30 conversations are of individuals. So expressing them is not a reflection of the 2.30 conversation or the seven day Adventist church or its affiliates position and or views. Whereas participants are encouraged to share their opinions and views without fear. 2.30 conversation abhors and shall not tolerate hate speech, hominin attacks and or conduct 
or views that seek to infringe on individuals' God-given and constitutional rights to human dignity. 230 Conversations, its sponsors and affiliates shall not be held liable for any views, opinions, conduct, and expressions that seek to undermine and infringe on God-given and, 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 God and constitutional rights. 230 Conversations aligns itself with and advances the position of the Seventh-day Adventist Church doctrines and practices. So once again, please take note that we do not seek to promote or to use this platform when we provoke or when we, when we come up with these topics, we're not provoking any condemnation or we're not provoking the audience to exhibit hate speech or to do anything that is not of uh, the SDA doctrines as we are part of the SDA church. Once again, I just needed, I felt uh, I, I had to stress that point. Please remember as well that we do have a data fund if you want to donate data uh, airtime, please contact Mta and Ashley. I know that their numbers are on this uh, screen. If you need their numbers, you can just put it on the chat message as well. And uh, thank you so much once again. I am going to unmute everyone. The speaker is welcome to leave. And uh, we're going to now have the after scenes. Those who want to say what they wanted to say and we're shy. Those who want to speak to Antony, maybe, you know, um, you, you, this is your time. This is your time. Thank you so much. Melissa, can we pray? Yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I, I was talking too much. I forgot. Thanks, Mta, for that reminder. Can you please pray for us? Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for everything that you continue to do for us. Thank you for this presentation. A tough one, but thank you for Kulufele. We held it down in the Holy Spirit. Lord, we taught him what to say. Thank you for everyone who came on this platform. We pray for healing. We pray for strength. We pray that we may overcome the sins that beseech us from all levels. We pray for Kulufele and his family. We pray that, Lord, there may be happiness and joy in his marriage. We pray for everyone here and their marriages and their relationships out there. Please do bring joy back. We pray for 230 conversation, the leadership, those that come up with ideas of what to do next. Please imbue them further with the Holy Spirit. Thank you and keep us safe, Lord, in such a world as ours. Teach us to love one another. Because you have said that they shall know us if we have loved one to another. Bless us abundantly for those that came for the first time and stayed as long as they did. We really appreciate that, Lord. Give them a special blessing and bless them during the whole week and keep us safe till we meet again on another topic as we prepare for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mta. Uh, everyone has the ability to unmute themselves so we can have our after scenes. I think we're going to go off live now on our Facebook. And yeah, uh, uh, yeah. let me go live. Let me go, uh, stop the live stream on Facebook. Um,